Welcome back. All of these Billionaire Bachelor Cove books are from a research trip that I did to Seattle with a whole bunch of wonderful author friends. You can find their billionaire books on Amazon as well as all of mine. And um, so Seattle trip was amazing. I know people complain that Seattle, it's raining all the time. Well, Seattleites, is that what they're called? Se are they really called Seattleites? <laughs> okay. People from Seattle don't complain that it rains all the time, but everyone else who goes there complains that it rains all the time. And the whole time we were there, we didn't have any rain, which was absolutely amazing. And we were so grateful, yay, for the weather that made that all possible. Okay, so this book in particular, Her Awkward Blind Date with Billionaire, was basically the whole entire book came out of the idea of having a blind date with a billionaire and not just a blind date, but a bad blind date. I mean, honestly, how many people, I had read a ton of books about these amazing blind dates that people went on with billionaires or that they didn't know the person they were with was a billionaire and all of these things. And I thought, what if it just went all the way wrong? And so I put together an outline of a really, really bad first date. I in no way no way at all based this book on any blind dates I have ever been on. But I did base the location on a restaurant that we visited in Seattle called Hattie's Hat. You can still go there today. They took a pirate's ship and made it into a bar, which was pretty dang awesome. So if you ever are in Seattle, look up Hattie's Hat and you can check out where this awkward blind date took place. So let's get right into it and start listening to Her Awkward Blind Date. Her Awkward Blind Date with a Billionaire A Billionaire Bachelor, Cove Romance Novel Written by Lucy McConnell Narrated by Christina Dimmick Copyright 2019 Chapter 1 I appreciate your help, Mr. Moreau. Benjamin Walker Wileby shook hands with the formidable attorney. The lawsuit filed by Ben's estranged father was a thorn in his and his brother's side. Hiring Adam Moreau, a.k.a. The Beast, had made all the difference in the case and their lives. His father's attorneys pulled every trick in the book to prolong the lawsuit, costing them millions, but Adam had put a stop to the nonsense and got them a court date. His brother, Quinn, had opted to work instead of coming today. His dad was also absent, preferring to leave the dirty work to the lawyers. It was just as well. He'd rather not spend time in the same room with the man who spewed venom and frosted the air with his icy glare. It's my pleasure. They dropped hands and Adam buttoned his jacket. The scars on his cheek, left over from an acid attack, were fading. Ben and his brother had attended the same boarding school as Adam. When Adam opened the cove, an exclusive neighborhood for the ultra-wealthy, Ben and Quinn were two of the first to pick out lots. Adam. Bella Creer, Adam's fiancé, entered the room like a splash of sunshine in a yellow dress that went well with her dark hair. Did you ask him about the trees? For the first time in their lengthy meeting, Adam smiled. His grin had more to do with the woman than it did with the subject she carried like a treasure in her pocket. Bella lifted her glasses on her nose and pressed her lips together. I was just getting to that. Adam reached for her, as if his hands couldn't stand to be in the same room and not brush the fabric of her dress. She leaned into his side, her arm around him. They made such a picture of engaged bliss that Ben's heart lurched, egging him on to find his soul mate and settle down. He chugged past the feeling, doing his best to stuff it back down in the dark recesses where it belonged so he could discuss his questionable lawn ornament and Bella's proposed solution to camouflaging it with giant trees. Did you talk to Mr. West? She Ben asked eagerly. Not only had she come up with an idea to hide the carnival ride, she'd figured out how to acquire the trees native to the area and fully grown at minimal cost. Ben had bought a carousel complete with antique horses, lions, and a dragon, from the city of New York. He'd had the piece expertly restored and installed in his front yard. The problem was the 1500 lights blinked and twinkled like a beacon on the hill, pointing a finger at their exclusive and heavily guarded neighborhood. I did. 
You were right, he's clearing an area for a horse arena and was more than pleased to transplant the trees to my neck of the woods, or lack of woods, as the case may be. His property was on the hill, where a lightning storm had inflicted damage only a few short years ago. Ben had vegetation, just not in the right place. Rather than harvest the back of his lot, he'd been happy to save over a dozen maples from his neighbor's land. The maples were large enough that they provided a canopy over his front yard. The effect was quite magical, though he'd never be caught saying that out loud. Who did he hire to transplant them? Bella asked. Ben chuckled. I'm not sure. I think I saw him out there on the tractor. Adam's jaw clenched. That man. Bella laughed. You can take the man out of Texas, but you can't take Texas out of the man. Ben grinned. He liked his cowboy neighbor, Jamon West, just the way he was, though he could see how West's down-home ways would rub old money like Moreau the wrong way. There was one incident involving West that included a runaway horse, a pair of boxers, and some cowboy boots that was talked about in hushed voices at any one of the many parties hosted by the residents of the cove. Ben's phone buzzed in his pocket, reminding him he had other obligations to tend to today. He ran his hand through his thick hair. I'm sorry. I have to be going. They stood and said goodbye. Ben made his way to the town car waiting out front and landed in the back seat, where his laptop, files, and a dozen papers waited. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir, said his driver, Gibbs. He spoke to the windshield, raising his voice, just loud enough to be heard in the back seat. Haven't even started, Gibbs. He gave the man his attention. Miss Savannah called while you were inside. She will land in ten minutes. Wonderful. He grinned. His daughter had stayed behind in California with the nanny and a personal bodyguard to finish up the semester. He'd missed her spunk and the noise she made in the house. He couldn't wait for her to see the carousel. She'd been his main inspiration when designing the house and landscaping, and therefore the home was practically a playground. Moving to Seattle felt like starting a new life. He'd stepped down as CEO of Magic Lamp Parks in order to have more time to spend with Savannah. As controlling shareholder, he had enough work to keep him busy, the evidence of that lay across the seat in piles of manila folders and loose papers. But the days of chasing his tail were behind him. Thank you, Gibbs. Let's see if we can beat her home. His phone rang, and the caller ID told him it was his neighbor. Dawson. What can I do for you? He and Dawson had met at Adam's welcome ball, though Ben hadn't stayed for long. Most residents had dates, and he didn't want to spend the night as a wallflower. Dawson had struck up a conversation and introduced him to the other stars of Tech Tank, a reality television show where inventors and coders pitch their ideas to a panel of millionaires and billionaires ready to either invest or send them packing. Dawson snapped his fingers. It's not what you can do for me, it's what I'm going to do for you. Why am I suddenly wary? Dawson chuckled again. You should be. I'm about to change your life. The hair on the back of Ben's neck stood up in warning. He could do with less change in his life at the moment. Dawson interrupted the awkward silence. We're working on a new feature for Capture My Heart, called Blind Date. Dawson's pet project was number one in the app store at the moment. Uh-huh. It's in beta. We're letting 200 people from Seattle try it out. Uh-huh. I'd like you to be one of those people. Uh, no. Ben swiped the folders into his hand and stuffed them into the pocket on the back of the seat before him. You'd be undercover. We'll make sure the women don't know who you are. Dawson, a dating app? He closed the laptop and stored it away too. Traffic crawled along. The tinted windows allowed him to look out but no one to look in. That's so beneath you. It's how I met Lizzie. Ben dropped his chin to his chest. Insert foot. I didn't mean it like that. Dawson grunted. She pitched the app on the show. Oh. 
How had he missed that story? It's doing well, better than we anticipated. But we need to stay ahead of the competition. No one's doing this. Because no one likes blind dates. That's why we've added incentives for our preliminary participants. The app will recommend a restaurant for your blind date, and the meal will be comped. You really think people are going to go out with a stranger for a free meal? I guarantee it. Why me? He rubbed the heels of his hands in his eyes. Because I need someone who will give me honest answers. Off the record stuff. Ah. Ben nodded. Magic Lamp Parks conducted countless surveys. He was well versed in the fact that there were limits on what you could and could not ask on comment cards. Besides, you're new in town, unbiased. Dawson wasn't letting up. Think of it as a way to meet new people. I'd rather think of it as an opportunity one said no to. Come on. Ben blew out a breath. Get me and Savannah tickets to the show, and I'll do it, once. His 12-year-old daughter would love to be a part of the Tech Tank audience. They'd watched the first season together and several episodes since then as time and homework permitted. You got it. I'll shoot you an email with instructions. Dawson paused, and the sound of typing came across the line. You know, the app is good. You might find someone you really like. Ben snorted. Yeah. Listen, you already have me for one date, you don't have to keep selling it. I'm just saying we've had 17 engagements since we launched. Good for you guys. All right, I'll quit bugging you. Just make sure you sign up by tomorrow night. I'll take care of it. They said goodbye and he hung up the phone, tossing it onto the seat beside him. Of all the dumb things to get involved in. A dating app. A blind date dating app. He'd thought making Forbes's billionaire list had turned his life upside down. Once his name was in print, the death threat started. Worse yet, people threatened to kidnap his daughter. He'd built a new home and left the state he'd grown up in just to keep them safe. Once he thought about it, being a guinea pig for a blind date app wasn't the weirdest thing that had happened to him lately. Chapter 2 Landon Luke Croft, what did you do to my phone? Avery Croft shook her phone in the air above her head. Nothing, he called down the stairs of their Seattle townhome. His voice echoed off the hardwood floors and mint green walls. Thankfully, they shared a wall with the world's most forgiving neighbor, Evelyn, who also doubled as the world's best babysitter. She pulled the phone out of the air and swiped through the screens. There's, like, five new apps on here. Her eyes landed on one icon with a heart, and her blood chilled to match the stormy temperature outside. Capture my heart. You have got to be kidding me, she mumbled as she tapped the screen. Sure enough, Landon had uploaded a profile picture of her and filled out all sorts of information on the dating app. Oh yeah, it was all there. Gender, female. Children, one. Born, Seattle, Washington. At least he got the comma in there. His expensive private school education was paying off. Her eyes bugged at the next section. What are you passionate about? He put baking, Hallmark movies, and roller coasters. Roller coasters. Really? Granted, Landon was 10, so his answers weren't going to be those of an adult, but this made her sound like a 15-year-old with a baby. Landon tromped down the stairs and stopped on the last one, which left them eye to eye. He was the tallest kid in his class, and she was five foot seven. She'd be looking up to her son before he hit high school. That was a depressing thought. Capture my heart? They said you get free dinner. She held back her eye roll. He was trying to be sweet. Landon, just because they offer you something free doesn't mean you have to take it. But you're always saying that we have to pinch our pennies. Pinch pennies, yes. Give away our time, no. His full cheeks dropped and took her heart right along with them. How much longer would he look like her baby? 
not long if he took after his father. Luke had shot up when they were in the third grade and always stayed a head taller than the other boys. She'd been by his side as a best friend, then girlfriend, and in college she'd become his wife. They'd gotten pregnant soon after, and she'd quit school to work so Luke could finish his degree. If only they'd done it the other way around. But they hadn't known that Luke was going to die. They'd thought they had forever. Forever wasn't real, which was why she couldn't stand to break her son's heart. What did it matter in the long run if he downloaded a few apps? I guess it couldn't hurt to look at the offer. Landon hesitantly lifted his chin off his chest. Avery hugged him and then rubbed her knuckles over his corn silk hair. Don't touch my stuff, she said, quoting one of his favorite movies. He shoved her hand away with a scowl. Are you going to go? Go where? To dinner. It's all set up. A place called Hattie's Hat? He wrinkled his nose. Maybe. He pulled his lips in tight for a sour face. Avery turned him towards the bathroom off the kitchen. Brush your teeth so we can get to school. I'll look into this. He slouched off. Avery thumbed through the app. There was a chat room and a place to flip through profiles of people who lived close and those who did not. She wouldn't mind a long-distance boyfriend, one who told her she was pretty and never showed up. She caught herself looking over her shoulder repeatedly, as if Luke's spirit was standing behind her skiing his tongue. Which was ridiculous. He'd told her to find someone new, eventually. A heart like yours, he'd said, must be shared to survive. Was five years eventually? She had no idea. What she did know was that she was lonely and growing lonelier with each year, each month, each day he was gone. So far, she'd been able to put the loneliness in a box and keep the lid on it, but there would come a time when it would burst open and consume her. A small number one lit up in the top right-hand corner of the app. Curious, she tapped on it. Her screen exploded with confetti and the words you have a blind date filled the space. What the? She tapped again and was offered some explanation. You have been selected for our exclusive blind date platform. Your date is Walker Wileby. You will be dining at Hattie's Hat at 7 on Friday. Press here to RSVP. Walker Wileby sounded like a Stanley character. She leaned closer to the screen to take a better look at his profile picture. He looked away from the camera, so all she could see was a his ear and part of his profile. He had nice brown hair, it was in that in-between stage where he didn't quite need a haircut, but she could tell he liked to wear it short. His sideburns were respectable. And his ear wasn't bad, as far as ears go. Landon popped out of the bathroom and grabbed his backpack off the hook by the door. Come on. I can't be late. Police. I know a lady, she'll fix your tardy like that. She snapped her fingers. He rolled his eyes. Mom, can I walk in by myself? Wha, why? They always walked into school together. When he was in the first grade and just starting at the Royal Belfast Academy of Seattle, he held her hand so tightly she couldn't wear rings for fear of being crushed by his little fingers. Now he didn't even want to walk with her. She glanced down at the simple silver band on her right hand. The day she'd taken off her wedding ring, she'd put this one on in remembrance of the man who made her believe in love. The man who should be here to hold her as she let go of their child one small bit at a time. Sure. Buddy. Landon stared out the window for the ride. She dropped him off in the carpool lane, her faded blue Toyota standing out like a sore thumb between a limo and a Rolls Royce. Once she parked in her designated spot, she took her insulated sack lunch and headed for the front office. Morning, Mrs. Croft, chirped Eva, an adorable third grader with downy soft blonde hair and bright green eyes. Morning, she chirped back. Other children said hello and waved. How's your head? she asked Bran. Yesterday, he decided that going down the slide backwards was a great idea. The doctor says I'm fine, but my nanny wouldn't let me go to the trampoline park. 
I'm sure you'll go another time, she said soothingly. Yeah. He cupped his hand around his mouth. Thanks for not telling anyone I cried. She widened her eyes in shock. You did? Hmm, I don't remember that. His smile widened and she hurried to her desk. You're happy this morning, said Claire, her best friend and fellow school secretary. She swiveled around the three two-drawer filing cabinets that separated their workspaces. One faced Avery, and the other Claire. They worked together to keep the front office of the number one ranked private school in Seattle running smoothly. Not a day went by that Avery wasn't grateful for the job that allowed her to bring her son to school and have the same days off he did. I'm laughing my guts out. Look at this. She dug her phone out of her purse, opened the app, and set it on the filing cabinet. Claire snatched it up. Her long nails were painted bright pink today. The color was beautiful against her caramel skin. She eyed the screen for a moment. I don't get it. What's so funny? Avery tipped her head. Landon thought he was getting me a free dinner. Claire gasped. With a blind date? Yep. He thinks he's wise in the ways of the world. Claire set the phone back down, grabbed the edge of her seat, and scooted it beneath her spin-class sculpted bottom. What are you wearing? I'm not going. You have to. I just RSVP'd. A strangled cry escaped Avery's throat. Why? Why would you do that to me? The guy has a steady job, says he likes roller coasters too, and has nice ears. Avery strangled her phone, because strangling people was frowned upon. Is that what qualifies for a date these days? Claire giggled. Honey, I've gone out with men with far less in common and some funky ears. Just go. You might have fun. I might die of embarrassment. He might be cute. He might be a serial killer. Claire pulled up a website, her chin lifted with superiority. Avery narrowed her eyes, suspicion skating through her mind. What are you doing? A background check. She leaned over the filing cabinets to see the computer better. You can do that? When Tad and I broke up, I started online dating. Doing a background check has saved me from two felons and a guy with a stunning amount of parking tickets. Avery groaned. See, this is what I'm talking about. I'm not equipped to handle it out there in the dating world. I only dated one man, and I'd known him my whole life. This, she waved her hands in front of the screen, is a Rubik's Cube. She folded her arms. I hate Rubik's Cubes. Claire scrolled. I can't find anything on him. You're safe. Ugh. Are you not listening? I don't know how to date. Then this is perfect. It's a blind date by an app. There are no expectations. Claire frowned. Although, you might want to take your peanut butter chocolate chip cookies just to substantiate your passion for baking. Avery threw a pen at her. Claire batted it away. I double dog dare you to go. Avery glanced around her desk, looking for a way to escape Claire hounding her all day. Her eyes fell on a large three ring binder. I'll go. And when it's a disaster, you have to do the absentee report. Claire's eyes narrowed in challenge. Fine. But when it's great and you realize you were scared for no reason, you do it this semester and you do mine next semester. Deal. They pinky shook on it. Avery pushed her phone away and tried not to think about the man with the brown hair, a nice shadow of scruff, and a corded neck, but her mind kept trying to create the rest of the picture and she ended up daydreaming about Hugh Jackman. Which, incidentally, calmed her immensely. Just one night. She had to make it through one dinner, and then she would be free to enjoy the next week of work, report free. A blind date was totally worth it. A feeling of peace enveloped her. Whatever happened tonight would let her know if she was ready for the dating world or not.
Chapter 3 The courtroom was a drab little space with gray walls, dark stained woods, and small windows. Ben sat next to his brother behind the wobbly table, feeling anxious, but not because things were going badly. On the contrary, Adam Moreau feasted on the prosecution. Dad's case is dying slowly and painfully, whispered his brother, Quinn. Ben nodded once, making it look more like a casual movement than an acknowledgement of Quinn's statement. Adam was brilliantly laying out his closing statement. He strode back and forth in front of the judge's bench, his hands clasped behind his back and his head held high. There were those in the room who stared at Adam's scars, but the majority of the audience held their breath, waiting for the death blow he threatened to deliver at any second. A man's last will and testament shouldn't be changed by the living. My client's grandfather wished to leave his grandsons his legacy. The why doesn't matter, contrary to what the prosecution has tried to make us all believe. What does matter is that Richard Wileby Sr. believed strongly enough in what he wrote that he signed his name as witness, being in full control of his mental facilities at the time. He made this decision, and we should stand by it, not only to honor his word but the word of every person who has lifted to the great beyond before and after him. If we allow Mr. Wileby Jr. to insert himself into this will at this time, what's to stop others from doing the same? A will is a sacred trust, a legally binding document, that allows peace of mind for one who is about to enter the unknown of life after this. To tamper with that is to tamper with the very laws that keep order and prevent chaos. The question today is not a matter of heart, but a matter of law. Thank you. Adam smoothed his hand down his tie as he sat. On the outside, Ben was a statue. On the inside, he was a chicken on a hot plate. Grandad had warned him and Quinn about the will, knew it would be a fight with their father, the man who'd left them all to chase his secretary across white, sandy beaches. Grandad had never been so humiliated nor serious when he'd told Dad he was out of the will. In typical fashion, Dad had brushed off the threat and went about his life gathering the young and the beautiful for parties on his yacht. The receptionist was long gone, replaced with a newer, blonder model who sat on the back row, chewing gum so loudly Ben thought he'd go mad. He'd turn to glare her into silence, only to have her shimmy her bosoms and wink at him. Heaven help them all, he would not call her mom. Mom was the steady one. She'd taken her half of the divorce settlement and headed for Europe, where she'd bought food carts, staffed them with locals, and made a fortune selling waffles to tourists in Germany. She was an undercover millionaire, undercover because she wore jeans and sweatshirts most days and drove a beat-up truck that wasn't large enough for Ben and Quinn to sit in the cab together. Her smile was widest when she was at a cart herself, meeting people from all over the world and sharing her passion for baked goods and great friends. The judge ruled in favor of Ben and Quinn. The tension that had held Ben stiff for more than three hours gushed out of his system, leaving his muscles too weak for good posture. Well done. He shook hands with Adam, and Quinn followed suit. Adam lifted one side of his mouth in a sinister smile. That was fun. A laugh gusted forth. Your idea of fun and my idea of fun are quite different, friend. A twinkle of uncertainty passed over Adam's face, it was there and gone so quickly that Ben thought back on what he'd said that may have cost it and came up blank. Perhaps, for your sake, I hope you don't have to face this fun again, friend. The last word caught before it came forth. Ben grinned. All these years the beast had lived in his castle alone, a man at the top of his field, friendless. Even in boarding school, he'd held himself aloof. Ben and Quinn were the only two he'd sit with during meals. Quinn must have picked up on the shade of loneliness in the man too, because he rubbed his hands together and said, we've played your game. Why don't you let us show you and Bella how the Wileby brothers have fun? Adam laughed, a deep rumbling sound that startled the prosecutors loitering at the table next to them. I'll talk to Bella. I think we might enjoy that. Good. Ben clapped him on the back and turned to go, but was stopped by his father's angry glare. I hate you, Dad ground out between his tobacco-stained teeth. Ben had hardly spared the man a glance over the day. He took a good look at him now, seeing the hard-etched lines in his skin, 
the hair loss filled in with some kind of powder to hide it and the way his suit hung limply on his frame. Dad's chosen way of life left its mark on the man. In ten years, Ben could pass him on the street and not recognize him. He hoped he never saw him again. The man from his youth who'd hauled his boys across the country to inspect parks was a better man. The kind of father Ben wanted to be for his daughter. A hundred biting remarks thundered through Ben's mind, each one more cutting than the last. But the words that came out were full of truth. I feel sorry for you. He did. He felt sorry that his dad would never know the joy of pushing Savannah on the swings when she was five and innocent. He'd never spend a Christmas morning full of happy squeals and wrapping paper. He'd never see his son walk his granddaughter down the aisle, though Ben could wait for that one. What you're chasing after will always leave you unhappy and dissatisfied. Dad narrowed his eyes and worked his mouth. His thin lips pressed out as if he were going to spit on Ben. He didn't spit. He said, you are no longer my son. Quinn leaned over Ben's shoulder. It's not like we consider you a father anymore, so. He shooed Dad away. Dad stormed out of the room. The blonde trotted after him, her heels clicking in step with her chewing. Ben hugged Quinn from behind. I cannot tell you how great it feels to be free of him. You don't have to tell me. Quinn let him go, and they shook hands all around. Sir? Gibbs approached, his head down inviting confidence. You're late. Late? Ben wasn't late, he was floating. They'd finally shaken off the deadwood scent of their father. What could go wrong in life? For your... Gibbs turned his back to the group and lowered his voice. Date. Ben leaned back, sizing Gibbs up with a glance. The man wouldn't joke, but for the life of him. Shoot. I have to go. He said the world's fastest goodbyes and broke into a light jog in the hallway. The car, he asked Gibbs, who wheezed just behind his left shoulder. In front. He shoved through the doors and ran down the steps. Gibbs yanked open the door and dashed around to the driver's side. How late am I? Ben slammed the door shut behind him. Ten minutes. Ben cursed. This is bad form, Gibbs. Yes, sir. He pulled up the blasted app on his phone. He hadn't been looking forward to this little experiment, but when the algorithm had matched him with an Avery Croft who enjoyed roller coasters and baking, he'd been intrigued. Her profile picture was as vague as his. She was looking in a mirror and the picture was taken from behind, so her reflection was blurred. Still, her long, dark hair with enough natural curl that it had volume was beautiful. Her olive skin, pink lips, and defined cheekbones gave her an exotic flair. He couldn't tell what color her eyes were. Green? Gray? She was a natural beauty, one that didn't need mounds of makeup. His first thought was, what does a woman like that need a dating app for? She could have dozens of men hanging on her every word, and yet there she was, online. He glanced at his watch, if she was still at the restaurant by the time he arrived. Faster, Gibbs. Gibbs's answer was a surge from the engine as he pressed down on the gas. Chapter 4 Hattie's Hat was not a big chain restaurant, the character and eclectic decor couldn't be duplicated time and again. There was one hat on the wall, a reddish-purple concoction that could have been there before Avery knew she was going to be a mother. The dining room was overseen by a long bar along one wall that belonged on a pirate ship, with ornate scrollwork and an aged mirror. Booths lined the wall opposite the bar, and a privacy wall shielded tables from those who came in through the front door. Avery's heart stammered at the thought that her date could be on the other side of that wall, waiting expectantly to find the love of his life. She scoffed at her drama queen thoughts. It was unlikely the man was after more than Hattie's famous fish and chips. A server in a black apron and a high ponytail that whipped side to side as she walked greeted Avery. She didn't have a name tag and didn't offer an introduction. One? I'm meeting someone. A blind date. 
from an app. She trailed off, not sure how much she should divulge and how much made her look like a dating noob. Right. The woman perked up, her ponytail swinging away. We've had a few of you come in already. Follow me. Avery fell and stepped behind her, her mind burning with curiosity. How'd they go? The other blind dates? The server smiled as she motioned to a table for two behind the partition. Fine, I guess. So no one ran out of here screaming? Avery set her purse on the chair next to her as she settled into the bow of the chair. It cradled her nicely as her nerves threatened to burst from her skin. You'd be the first. The server patted her arm, bringing to attention the grip Avery had on the seat. Her fingers straightened. Sorry. First date jitters. Been there. Relax. If it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Easy for her to say. She had the innocence of youth on her side. What did Avery have? A child, a mortgage, a dead husband, and a muffin top she was desperate to hide. She folded her arms over her stomach. Can I get you something to settle your mood? The server tipped her head to the bar. I'll just sip water. She watched another couple, wondering if they were from Capture My Heart as well. If they were, things were going well. They held hands and smiled at one another, their food forgotten and going cold. Her water came, and she thanked the server with a smile. She checked the time, wondering if she'd come too early. Nope. He was late. She held back her sigh. There were a million reasons for tardiness. Traffic had been poor for her. Parking in Seattle was always a challenge. Working late? She forced out a breath, her lungs too tight. What was she doing trying to date again? Her foot bounced, tapping the floor like a steel drum. Rat tat tat. Fifteen minutes and one destroyed napkin later, her server appeared. Do you want to order an appetizer or meal? Her gaze darted to the floor in sympathy. A shudder of humiliation rippled through Avery. Stood up on a blind date. How pathetic. It's covered by the app. Well, then. Avery plucked the menu from behind the salt and pepper shakers. I'll have the voodoo burger and Hattie's fries with tartar sauce. Cajun or regular? Cajun, please. Of course. The server gave her a you-go, girl grin, flipped her ponytail, and hurried off to put in her order. The trauma of first dating melting away now that the pressure was off. Landon would be glad that she'd enjoyed the dinner he procured, and she wouldn't have to make small talk with a stranger, nice ears or no. Besides, it didn't matter how nice your ears were if you didn't show up for a date. Her food was delivered, steaming and smelling divine. She'd have to find a way to come back here with Claire. A sign for karaoke night hung on the wooden partition. They hadn't been out for people watching in ages. She frowned as she twirled a fry in the tartar sauce. Karaoke could be fun. More for watching than singing, but she'd been known to carry a tune. Becoming a stick in the mud was no bueno. What she needed was to change things up. She bit into the fry and immediately gasped, they were spicy. She fanned her face and clutched her water glass, gulping. Avery, I presume? The water she tried to swallow grabbed onto her throat, and it was a moment before she could breathe. Her eyes pricked with unshed tears as her gaze followed long legs up a trim torso to a face sculpted by devil angles who tempt women into unholy thoughts. His clear brown eyes containing a dash of adventure stole her breath away. Yes, she shrilled. Clearing her throat, she applied as much cool as she could muster. Yes. I'm Walker. Curses. Avery dropped the hand fanning her face and lurched to her feet like a puppet on stiff stings. Nice first impression. Her girly insides were all melty at the sight of him and she couldn't seem to gather enough oxygen to stop panting. But that was the Cajun, right? Ben turned to give Avery a moment to collect herself. 
He'd startled her, at least, he hoped that's why she panted. He signaled a server in a black apron for a drink, first pointing at Avery's glass and then his chest, and pulled out a chair. Avery stood staring at him for a moment before she too sat down. She was prettier than her photo let on. Perhaps she did that on purpose to weed out men like his father who were only after a beautiful face. I see you've already ordered. He tugged on his tie. If he'd been thinking past the courtroom, then he could have been here in time. But his dad had gotten the better of him, drawn him into trading disowments. His father hated him. It wasn't a surprise, but it was a blow. Yeah. She wiped her mouth with her napkin. I, uh, didn't think you were coming. His neck warmed. He hadn't meant to put her on the spot. The server appeared with a water glass and a notepad. He glanced over the menu. His stomach was still sour from the sneer on his father's face. I'll have a side salad with ranch. Something light ought to help settle things. Then he could order real food. Like her burger and fries. The server exchanged a look with Avery. It was one of those that said, Are you sure about this? Avery nodded. Do you know her? he asked. Avery brushed away a stray lock of hair. We just met tonight. He narrowed his eyes, trying to get a read on this woman. Either she was lying, or she was the world's friendliest patron. He couldn't find a nervous twitch, so he dropped it. Laying his napkin in his lap, he sipped his water. After several moments of silence, he chuckled uncomfortably. I hate first dates. It's no picnic for me either, she muttered, picking at her food. I didn't mean. She stood up, setting her napkin on the chair. Excuse me. I'm going to wash my hands. He stood, holding his tie back from the table, and once she was gone, he sat back down with a soft grunt. Their server came by to top off their waters. I'm afraid I upset her by being late, he explained. She hissed through her teeth. It certainly puts you in the hole. He loosened his tie, took off his jacket, and rolled up his sleeves. Feeling a little more like himself, he was ready to give this another shot. Avery held her phone between her shoulder and her cheek as she washed her hands. She'd used the excuse that she needed to freshen up as an opportunity to call the babysitter, Evelyn, but she didn't feel right lying to anyone, so she actually had to wash them. About the only thing going for him is that he's better looking than his profile picture. I told you not to go. Evelyn didn't believe in holding back. I know. You can rub it in when I get home. Avery glanced behind her in the mirror to make sure the door was shut. Call me in ten minutes. If it gets worse from here, then I can say my sitter needs me. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, remind me and I'll text you. Avery patted her hands dry with excessive force. I can't remind you, Evelyn. I'll be at the table. The point is for you to text me first so it doesn't look like I'm trying to get out of the date. Honey, my show is on. If you want me to remember something, you're going to have to help me out. For the love of all things caramel. Okay. I think I can preset a text to send at a certain time. She said goodbye, figured out the preset, and checked her hair. She looked good. Calm. This was just another evening, and it would be over soon. Ben glanced at the skinny hallway where the bathrooms were located. It had been a few minutes since Avery disappeared, longer than necessary. Was she avoiding him, passive-aggressive about him being late? Was he reading too much into all this? Probably. If he could just shut off his brain, he'd be much cooler. He took another long pull from his water glass. He'd almost drained it. At this rate, he'd be the one in the bathroom. His phone vibrated on the table. He snagged it and read the message from his brother. Talked to Herb. He says you're on a date. How is she? Wonderful. 
he'd have to have a word with his personal assistant. Quinn may be his closest kin, but that didn't give Herb the right to hand out Ben's personal information. Didn't he have any idea what a brother could do with first date screw-ups? There'd be teasing for months. Angry because I was late, he texted. Serves you right. Shut up. His stomach rumbled. The salad hadn't made an appearance yet, and his nerves had calmed considerably. He thought back to the eleven o'clock lunch of cold cuts on dry bread with fondness. He'd take another one of those pathetic sandwiches if it would curb his growing hunger pains. Now that he was aware of how hungry he was, he couldn't stop thinking about food. Avery's fries looked especially amazing. They smelled spicy and had his mouth watering. He'd grab one, just to taste. If he liked them, he'd order his own plate. He snatched a fry and popped it in his mouth. Hey! Avery slid into her seat with a grace few women possessed. Hey, he replied, trying to chew without being obvious. She tipped her head to the side and glanced to the empty table in front of him. Did you eat my food? Um, he chewed some more. The back of his eyes started to burn. He sucked in air and his throat itched. He cursed silently. This felt like an allergic reaction. What's on those? He reached for his water, tipping the cup way, way back to get the last of the liquid. The ice clinked together and then landed against his lips. She leaned away from him. They're Cajun. He spit the fry and water out in surprise, showering Avery. She lifted her arms to the side her face a mask of horror and shock. He didn't have time to apologize. He grabbed her glass, took a large drink, swished and spit it into his cup. He gargled the next mouthful. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Avery wiping her face with her napkin. He'd never live this down. He stumbled to his feet. The itching had slowed, but he needed to the AP in his glove box, just in case. I have to go. You're leaving me? Her voice was high and loud in the quiet, muted restaurant. He didn't care, he was the fool. Sorry. He took off, rounding the partition and slamming into the server. His salad and a carafe of water hit the floor. Sorry, he muttered as he pushed open the glass door and surged into the night. His throat was holding steady at itchy and slightly swollen. He might be able to just take a pill and avoid the apy. The street was crowded with couples and groups going to dinner or to drink. His car was at the Hotel Ballard across the street. He needed to slow it down, a calm heart was the first defense against an allergy like his. Stupid. He knew better than to eat red spices, without asking. He walked through the lobby, waving off the concierge as he beelined it for the elevator to the garage. Soft music played in the background, the kind that reminded him of clinking crystal and golden flatware. Once he was in his car, had taken an allergy pill, and felt like he might just survive physically, he about died of embarrassment. Hopefully, Dawson didn't hear about this. Chapter 5 There were chunks on the front of her shirt. Avery tried not to freak out. She was a mother. She'd cleaned up all sorts of bodily fluids in her day. Walker had done his worst, and she'd survived. She'd get through this. She tried breathing through her nose to slow things down. The room spun, and people ran back and forth from the kitchen. Three guys rushed out to help clean up the mess her date had made on the way out. A mop appeared for the water and a broom to sweep up the salad. They made sure her server was okay. She brushed them off and rushed to Avery's side. Here. She pulled several wet wipes and small packets out of her apron. For your face. Avery laughed sadly. I feel like I should know your name. She smiled. Hope. Avery laughed again, a little lighter this time. That's appropriate. Thanks, Hope. She ripped open a wipe and mopped her face, not caring if her makeup survived. 
Don't mention it. I can't believe that guy. Hope opened several other wipes, pointing at places Avery had missed. This is, by far, the worst date in history. Hope's lips went into a straight line. I'd argue, but I've never been spit on. They met gazes and burst into laughter. Hope finally settled into Walker's empty seat. I'd offer you a to-go box, but I don't think you want that. Her burger bun was a soggy mess. I'll bring you another one, on the house, said a guy in a tight black shirt with an Italian playboy smile. Thanks. Avery dropped the wipes in a pile on her plate. I wondered if I was ready to date again, I guess I got my answer. Hey, you'll find the right guy. Have you? Hope nodded. Several times. I just can't seem to commit. I think I had the right guy. Avery's vision blurred slightly as she thought back to a simpler time. I had my shot at love. What happened? Hope leaned her arms on the table. Miraculously, Walker's side of the table was dry. Car crash. He died. Getting to the point of summing up a heartache so big it eclipsed the sun for years was a sad accomplishment. And you end up dating this yo-yo? Tragic. Mr. Yummy Italian guy handed her a to-go box. Have a good night. He hustled away to check on his tables. Avery shook off the horror of having her face painted with ice water and french fries. It's all good. I'm swearing off dating for another year. She stood up, shaking her hands and trying not to think about the squishy things that fell to the floor. The mess wasn't hers to clean up, so that was good. But she felt bad for Hope. She dug some money out of her purse and set it on a dry spot for a tip. I'll probably still be here, waiting tables. I hope I see you. Hope began piling dishes to take to the kitchen. And when you find Mr. Wright, grab onto him. Thanks. I'm going to go home and shower so long my water heater cries. I'll cash you out and the app will cover your meal. I'll see you later. Hope lifted one hand in a wave. Bye. Avery pushed through the door, careful not to drop her to-go box. Her phone beeped, and she did a fancy move to retrieve it from her purse as she walked. It was Capture My Heart, asking her to fill out a short survey about her experience. She tipped her head back and cackled. Oh, she'd fill that bad boy out. She'd fill out every field. Someone had to know the havoc they'd inflicted on her night. Only me, she lamented as she got into the car and started typing. Chapter 6 Mrs. Croft, we have a new student. Avery glanced up from the computer screen to find a child with honeysuckle brown hair and large brown eyes tucked into herself standing in front of the principal. She smiled shyly, and Avery's heart went out to her. The first day in a new school was worse than a first date any day. Hi. Avery reached for a new student folder and moved around the desk to shake hands with the girl. They'd known this one was coming for quite some time. Apparently her father had moved to Seattle over a month ago, but she'd opted to stay behind until the end of term. Would you be so kind as to show Savannah around the school? I have a phone call with the district office shortly. Principal Brown aimed his barrel chest at his office. He had great posture, putting his belly first through the hallways. Of course. As soon as the principal was out of hearing distance, Avery leaned sideways and whispered out of the side of her mouth. Don't tell him, but this is my favorite part of the job. Savannah dropped her arms to her side and gave a Mona Lisa smile. I'm Mrs. Croft. Who might you be? Savannah Wylaby. It's a pleasure to meet you. Wylaby? The name rose up like a specter, making her hair stand on end. She quickly checked the folder for Savannah's father's name. Benjamin Wylaby. Not Walker Wylaby, like the man from the Capture My Heart app. Phew. Avery pointed to the hall on the left, lined with red lockers and gray carpet. That leads to the junior high, you'll be there next year. 
But this year, you're on the elementary side. She took one dramatic step that direction before shortening her stride to match Savannah's. Savannah rubbed her nose. I was in secondary at my old school. Really? I find it fascinating how each school is a little different from the last. I'm sure you'll see many similarities between us and your alma mater. Savannah plucked at the front of her white shirt. We had casual Friday. Her eyes drifted to follow a class of middle schoolers headed to the locker rooms. Her eyes dropped down to her front. Do you think I should wear a bra? Avery's heel snagged on the carpet and she rolled her ankle. What? It's just, there were a lot of girls at my old school that did. A quick mental review of Savannah's file reminded Avery that her parents were divorced and mom was not listed as an approved emergency contact. Who else was the girl going to ask? Avery had a son, they didn't have to talk about things like bras. Landon preferred it that way, actually. She dragged up a load of wisdom her mother had used on her. You know, if you feel like you need one, it's probably time. Savannah nodded sagely. Avery hoped this more confident side of the girl came through to the children. Being shy was like blood in the water to children. They smelled your fear and lashed out to try and put you in your place. Not that the kids at their school were mean. They had a strict no tolerance, no bullying policy. The principal was serious about it too, having expelled three students the year the policy was put in place, no one dared push the limits. Chewing gum in class? That one they pushed, constantly. But the principal laughed it off with, if they think chewing gum is rebelling, then we've got great kids. Avery had to agree. They rounded a corner into a hallway lined with coat hooks full of backpacks and rain slickers. It was Seattle, after all. This is where you'll be for most of the day. She spread her arms out. Finding grades is easy enough. We start with first grade here. She pointed to the two classrooms, one on either side of the hallway. The doors were open and the kids chanting came through, when two vowels go walking, the first does the talking. The kids stood by their desks, marching as they repeated the rhyme. Adding movement to learning increased a child's ability to remember what they were being taught. And children loved to move. Her own son had come home chanting and marching with enthusiasm all through third grade. And second grade. She pointed to the next two. And so on. You're in sixth, so your classes are at the end of the hall. Savannah took it all in with her big brown eyes. Clear brown, with no flecks or black rings. Just warm, inviting, like walkers had been. Avery mentally shook herself. There was no reason to think of Walker, or the likes of Walker, or anyone who looked like Walker ever again. Her ego was still smarting from the other night, and a pretty face did not make the man a prince. These are the bathrooms for the fifth and sixth grade, and this is the music room. Let's head to the counselor's office, and we'll assign you a peer tutor. What's that? Someone in your class, to help you figure things out for a few days. Savannah's jaw tightened with determination. If only Avery could wrap her in her arms and tell her everything was going to be all right. We're the top-rated school in Seattle for science, math, and English classes, and our sports programs feed into colleges all over the nation. I know. That's why my dad signed me up. Only the best for you, she mocked in a low voice. I know exactly how he feels. That's why my son goes here. He's in the fifth grade, so you'll probably meet him. That'd be nice. They made their way into the counselor's office and Avery introduced Savannah to everyone, who smiled in return and welcomed her to campus. Mr. Jones, the counselor over the elementary school-aged children, took over, calling to her future classroom for a volunteer peer tutor. They liked to ask the last student to move in to tutor the next one since they understood how it felt to walk into a classroom without a friend. Avery made her way back to the front office. The office looked more like a private university study than it did an office. 
The back wall was lined with bookshelves, and the shelves were lined with the kind of books that looked pretty but no one actually read, like out-of-date encyclopedias that crackled when the pages turned and the complete works of C.S. Lewis, which Avery would like to read, if she ever had the time to sink into a book that required teeth. Hey, you're back. Claire had taken the morning off to have some dental work done. Her cheek was swollen and her eyes red. You sure you want to be here? She nodded, cupping her face. I have to do the absentee report. Guilt showered Avery. Oh my gosh, I'll do the report. You don't have to make yourself miserable. She hung her slightly damp jacket on the back of her chair before wrapping her knuckles on the three-ring binder from Hades. Fair's fair. You went on the date, I'll do the report. Please tell me my suffering is worth it. Was he hot? Avery leaned back in her chair and applied a dreamy look to her face, saying breathlessly, he had the ears of a Greek god, the eyes of a pirate, and the eyebrows of a sculpture. Whatever that meant. Claire punched the air. Avery dropped her dreamy gaze and applied sarcasm like deep red lipstick. Unfortunately, that was all he had going for him. He can't be that bad. Avery laughed maniacally. Jairl, let me tell you. She started at the beginning and laid every little detail out there with relish. I washed, rinsed, and repeated, twice, before I could go to bed. Claire alternated between holding her face and holding her sides she laughed so hard. I, pant, pant. Have never, pant, pant. Avery didn't wait for her to get her breath. I've never, either. You know what? I fell asleep comparing him to Luke. The laughter slowed. I'm sorry, Han, Claire patted her hair to make sure it was still in the messy bun at the base of her neck. With heavy counseling from her pastor, Avery had come to a place of acceptance and peace so she wasn't in a hole of grief over the revelation. It was more of a surprise. My pastor once told me that nothing makes a man perfect in his wife's eyes like death. At the time, I thought he was nuts, but now, I think he may be onto something. How so? Well, Luke gets more perfect in my memory as time goes on. Like, I don't think about how he'd set his clothes right next to the hamper. Ugh. Claire threw her hands in the air. Why can't they put them in the basket? I know, it's right there. It used to drive me insane. But do you think I thought about that last night? No, all I could think about was how Luke never left without tipping, even if I bought dinner, he insisted on leaving the tip. He also used to hook our pinkies instead of hold hands, and he'd buy flowers from Pike Place for my birthday. Claire's eyes softened. You'll have better luck with the next guy. I'm not dating for a year. Self-preservation, she vowed. The fifth graders walked past the open office on their way to the cafeteria. Avery scanned the line and waved at Landon. He rolled his eyes, and he faced forward. What was that? Avery glared after the little stinker. He's growing up. It's not cool to wave at your mom with the guys hanging around. He's growing an attitude. That too. Claire smirked. Avery folded her arms. Half the time, I don't know if I should ground him or hug him. Probably both. Right. Luke would have known what to do. As much as Avery missed the man, she missed having a man in her life to partner with to raise her son. She was no fool, anyone she brought in at this point would be a huge adjustment for the both of them. He'd have to love Landon as much as he loved Avery, and with her son's sunny disposition lately, finding a man who could see through that would be a miracle. Chapter 7 When I stepped down as CEO, I assumed I'd have more free time. Ben glared at his younger brother. They were in the back of Ben's town car, waiting in a line to pick up Savannah from her first day of school. It was all he could do not to shove the door open and charge in there to rescue his baby. She'd texted during lunch that she hated uniforms. Hated the rain. Hated Seattle. Hated the PB&J he'd made her that morning. 
Only babies eat PB&J. The day before, PB&J was her favorite. He rubbed the pang above his right eye. Pre-teenager. As in a precursor of what was to come, or a preview of the hormones about to take over his sweet little girl. Put on the glasses. The simulator is ready. Quinn shoved a pair of 3D goggles his direction. A long black cord ran from the clunky headgear to the laptop. Inside that little gold box were the plans for a new coaster, one they hoped to reveal to the shareholders next month. Quinn had seven more coasters in various stages of development. One of the reasons Magic Lamp Parks were so popular was their willingness to challenge physics. There was a fine line between giving a ticket holder the thrill of their life and inducing seizures. Quinn was the genius behind the daring adventures that left riders gasping for breath, he lived for this stuff. Ben glanced out the window, noting the three security guards casing the parking lot. The one on the end, the guy with the mullet, stared at his car. Probably memorizing make and model or matching it against the list of approved vehicles. The school required him to list not only the people allowed to pick up his daughter, but also the make, model, and license plate numbers of the car she was allowed to travel into and from school. He'd had his personal assistant prepare the list and checked it himself. He didn't cut corners when it came to his daughter. Even though Herb was more loyal to Savannah than he was to Ben, he could never quite trust another person to take over something he felt a father should do. And a father should protect his family. The clock on the tower on the front of the building showed five minutes before the final bell rang. The front of the school reminded him of the clock tower on Back to the Future. It had the same lions framing a giant white clock face. Was it gargoyles in the movie, or lions? He couldn't quite remember. He'd have to watch it again. He turned to his brother. Did we ever watch Back to the Future with Savannah? Quinn shook his head, his eyes locked on the screen. Too much swearing for a five-year-old. She hasn't been five in forever, he mumbled. Back to the Future's been out for forever. She needs to see it. It's a classic. He looked up at the clock again. It didn't have any F-bombs, did it? No, but all the great 80s flicks are full of curses. Remember Goonies? Vaguely, another classic, though. Agreed. They fell into contemplative silence for a moment. The three amigos. Ben snapped his fingers. I don't remember a lot of swearing in that one. Mom, screamed a kid standing next to the car in front of them. Open the bleep de bleep bleep door. Ben and Quinn exchanged a look full of if we had talked to MLM like that. Remind me why I'm trying to find a movie without curse words when my daughter has that walking down the hall at school. Quinn opened and closed his mouth. Am. Because you want to protect her innocence? Ben groaned. I can't even think about the world my daughter's growing up in without seriously freaking out. Come on. Mom said the same thing when we were young. We turned out okay. Ben snorted. Okay-ish. Quinn sniffed. We're not serial killers. Well, there is that. The bell rang, and Ben pushed the goggles back to Quinn. She's coming. An invisible hand gripped his chest as he waited on bated breath. His first sight of Savannah would tell him all he needed to know about her day. A rush of kids flooded the sidewalk, teachers busy calling names for the kids to jump into the cars in the front of the line. Kids joked and shoved, only half paying attention. The line crept forward. There. Quinn pointed out the windshield. Savannah wore her backpack on one shoulder, her back slumped and her arms hugging her chest. Her chin was down as if she was begging the heavens to make her invisible. Come on, he said under his breath. Lift your chin. As if she'd heard his voice in her head, Savannah looked up, right at the car. Her posture didn't straighten, but she changed direction. A teacher opened the door for her, and she slid into the seat facing him and Quinn. Hey, Dad, Uncle Quinn. 
A grin split her face, and Ben exhaled for the first time since she'd stepped out of the building. Hey, Loop. Quinn used his nickname for Savannah. A loop was an element on a coaster that sent riders vertical, turned them over, and deposited them right side up. That pretty much explained what Savannah's arrival had done for Quinn, think three men and a baby. He'd lobbied for Loop to be her official name when he and Ben had driven her home from the hospital. Thank the good lord above that Quinn wasn't in charge of filling out the birth certificate. Ben tugged Savannah across the space and into his arms, where no harm could ever befall her and no one would ever make her cry. How was school? He pressed a kiss to her hair and then surrendered her to Quinn, who hugged her just as fiercely. She settled back into the seat between them, her eyes full of light that stems from the knowledge that you are loved and adored. If he could bottle that feeling and sell it, he'd be a gazillionaire. Forget that, if the potion would save any child from looking the way Savannah had when she'd walked out of school, he'd give it away. And he'd be a hero to parents everywhere. Uniforms are so stupid. She folded her arms and lifted her chin, daring either of them to disagree. The lightning in her eyes said she had four counterarguments ready. Agreed. Ben defused the bomb, wishing others were that easy. He'd taken a bold step moving to the cove. There was no neighborhood like the one Adam Moreau dreamed up, with the finest security team working the private sector, he could sleep without one ear listening for an intruder in the house come to ransom his daughter. He could handle the threats against his own life, but threats against his daughter brought a cold sweat to his brow. If you agree, why did you pick a school that has uniforms? She flung her arms to her sides as she sank against the seat, the weight of his decision too much for her to bear any longer. She was getting good at preteen drama. Because they're the best. And my girl deserves the best. And the kids were from the same income level. Most of them, anyway, some won scholarships to attend. These people would be her peers in the adult world too. Making contacts could never start too young. His neighbor, Jetton Bolt, had suggested this school, and he'd been impressed with the tour, the extracurricular opportunities for the upperclassmen, and the administration. She flopped herself to the door and stared out. There's a class trip in two weekends. They need chaperones. That's your weekend with your mom. I told them, they were fine. It sounded fun, though. They're hiking, collecting samples for nature journals, taking pictures. There's a picnic. It does sound fun. And it would be a good introduction to Washington for the both of them. He wished his ex, Grace, was flexible, but when she picked a weekend, she expected them to make it happen. If she got busy? Well, that was another story completely. They're having a carnival this week, it's a fundraiser for the trip. We're supposed to be there. I'll check the schedule. I'm sure we can make it work. Savannah's face was a mask. He wished he knew what was going on inside her head. If she didn't want to go to the carnival, he would make up an excuse and they'd watch the three amigos. How'd your date go last night? asked Savannah. Date? Quinn perked up, ready to tease his brother mercilessly. Don't get excited. Ben lounged casually in the corner. It was awful. Quinn opened his laptop. Now that Savannah was safely inside the car, his mind wandered back to work. He may never retire, not when the job called to him like a siren. You win some, you lose some. Ben had lost more than Quinn knew. Savannah picked at a seam in the leather seat. Did she look like her picture? Yes better, actually. He thought back to that first moment when he'd stumbled in and caught sight of her. His breath had caught in his throat, and he'd been speechless. At least she was honest. She was that. Honest enough to tell him it was no picnic being on a date with him. Honest enough not to hide her shock at his behavior. He hadn't freaked out over an allergic reaction like that in a long time. His nerves had been all lit up because it was a date and he hadn't handled himself well. Who was he kidding? 
he'd been a complete and utter disaster of a man. Can we go shopping this weekend? asked Savannah. Sure, he replied, his thoughts replaying the moment when he'd spit partially chewed fries all over Avery, recalling details he'd rather not. Savannah reached for her backpack and pulled out a granola bar. Hey, is that the new coaster? She reached for the goggles, and soon she was virtually whisked away and literally screaming and weaving in her seat. Ben considered sending Avery flowers to apologize, but decided it was better if he left her alone and never showed his face in Hattie's hat again. Chapter 8 The department store was full of shoppers, women in trench coats, and men in casual attire. Gold chandeliers lit the walkways dividing sections, and snooty salespeople pretended they didn't want the hearty commission they earned by telling shoppers they looked fabulous, darling. Avery didn't normally shop here except to buy land and school clothes, and he'd torn a hole in his khaki pants at recess yesterday. She'd been limping them along by starching and ironing the thinning cotton, as if the fabric of the universe would rip right along with the threads. She'd already bought him two new pair of pants since school started because of an ill-timed growth spurt. Because she worked at the school, Landon had free tuition, which was a huge blessing. She'd been able to provide him with a better education than she or Luke could have hoped for, but it came at a cost. $112 for pants cost. Could she have picked up a pair on Amazon? Yes. But Landon's friends all had pants from this store. While she knew there were lessons to be learned from not letting your wealth define you, she didn't want her kid to be the weirdo. Besides, they didn't have any wealth, so there wasn't much definition going on there. Since Landon hated pants shopping more than taking out the garbage, she'd planned this trip with Evelyn, her next-door neighbor and good friend, while he was at a birthday party. Can we stop in the unmentionables? Evelyn whispered as if the words were forbidden in polite society. She'd worn her best pair of brown slacks and a light pink sweater. She'd curled her graying hair but didn't wear any makeup. She said that at her age, the color slipped into the wrinkles like a daily covergirl landslide. Of course, but you just bought a pack of six a couple of weeks ago. Sometimes Evelyn forgot where she put things, or that she'd bought them. Honey, I'm at the age where I sneeze my pants at least once a day. I can't have too many options in the drawer. Avery shook off that mental image. The things she had to look forward to. All righty, then. She hooked elbows with Evelyn, and they wandered in the direction of lace and satin. A small sniff caught her attention, and she turned to find Savannah huddled near a display of ladies' nightwear. Evelyn, you go on ahead. I need to take care of something. Evelyn glanced around Avery to see what had caught her attention. The deep lines around her eyes softened. She patted Avery's arm even as she slipped her other arm free. I'll be that way when you're ready. Avery approached slowly so as not to startle the girl. Savannah? Is everything all right? Savannah rubbed her nose with the back of her hand. At the sniffing sounds that she made, Avery immediately retrieved a tissue and pressed it into her empty hand. The other was hiding something behind her back. What's that? Avery asked carefully. Ugh. Savannah practically wailed. Her arm slowly came around, revealing a bra with rainbows and unicorns. It must have been made for a two-year-old, because it was tiny. My dad told me to try this on. Avery internally cringed. Wheelial. It might be too small. And too ugly. Can you imagine wearing this in the locker room to change for gym? I'd rather die. Avery tugged the smile that threatened to escape back into place. Dying over underclothing might be a tad dramatic. Not this. Savannah glared at the offensive fabric. Her tears were drying up. She had more fire inside than she'd let on the other day. She was also funny. Her face made a hundred different expressions in under a minute. Avery visually combed the area. She didn't see a man standing around. Perhaps he'd sat down on one of the benches. Poor guy having to take his daughter bra shopping. 
Her father would have had a stroke if she'd asked him to go anywhere near the women's section, let alone stand at the counter to pay for her underthings. She had to give Savannah's dad props for coming, even if he'd wandered off to fortify his resolve. She spied a solution to Savannah's dilemma. Why don't you give me that? The leprechaun probably wants it back. Savannah giggled and flipped the hanger around as she placed it in Avery's outstretched hand. And try this one on instead. The bra was white with a small bow in the middle and a tiny bit of lace at the edges. It was conservative and yet cute enough to appeal to a preteen. If you like it, we'll get a couple in different colors. Savannah's whole face lit up. That's perfect. Thanks. She happily trotted off to the changing room. Avery scanned for Savannah's dad once again. She walked around a few clothing racks and checked under them as if this were a game of hide-and-seek. When she couldn't find him, she got on her tiptoes to look for Evelyn. Her shopping partner had wandered off and was nowhere to be seen. She could be in men's shoes, for all Avery knew. Thank goodness for cell phones. Just as she was about to call Evelyn, she spotted a familiar face. Crazy Walker Wileby. Ducking behind the display of D-cups, Avery held her breath. What was he doing in women's underclothing? Oh, yuck. He was that guy? She should have known. Never blind dating again. She crept to the edge of the display and peeked around the corner. Avery asked a deep, completely recognizable voice from behind her. She whirled around and lurched to her feet. Walker Wileby stepped back as if he expected her to throw something at him. After what had happened on their date, she probably should. Instead, she gripped the leprechaun bra in her hand. Walker. He rubbed the barely discernible stubble on his chin, and she was caught off guard by the warmth swirling through her belly. I didn't expect to see you again. Small world. Avery bristled. That's what he had to say to her after sending her home smelling like, well, she didn't want to think what she'd smelled like. Too small for the two of us, she said, blurting out a line from Indiana Jones. As angry as she was at Walker, she secretly bounced on her toes and squealed. She'd been waiting ages to use that line in real life. How often does a woman get the chance to quote a classic movie? This was totally excellent. Walker grinned a Harrison Ford smile. To her surprise, her knees went weak at the sight of it. Not many men could pull that off, and Walker did it with style. This is the first time I've had to reclaim my property from you. He may have adapted the next line from the Indiana Jones movie to fit the situation, but he also took the bra out of her hand. Which was weird. She stepped back, remembering where they were and that he was the enemy. You going to wear that? She arched an eyebrow. No, I, he flipped around in a circle, flustered. Which was also kind of cute, because his eyebrows puckered. My daughter. A warning voice whispered in Avery's head that she needed to proceed with caution. Her brain skittered across the available information. Savannah? Yes. He pulled away from her, wary that she knew his daughter's name. Just then, Savannah bounded over, her arm wrapping around Walker's back as she leaned into him. Thank you, Mrs. Croft. Did you have more? I want to try them all on. Avery came to herself and gathered a selection of colors, which Savannah skipped with back to the changing rooms. Walker cocked his head. Did I miss an introduction? Do you work here? Avery grunted. I'm a secretary at Royal Belfast Academy. Ah. The light of understanding made his brown eyes all the more intelligent. Avery reminded herself that no matter how smart, no matter how attractive Walker was, he was not dating material. A man who wasn't dating material was not marrying material. So. She pointed to the unicorn and rainbow monstrosity. That was your pick? Her voice rang with superiority. What? he asked innocently. She's like five. 
and she likes unicorns. Avery shook her head sadly. I wish they stayed that sweet. My son won't let me hug him in public anymore. She clamped her lips shut. Walker didn't need to know that. He smiled easily, like the small factoid had been an offering of forgiveness. It wasn't, and Avery was irked she'd let it slip out. Hug him anyway. He'll thank you one day. Did your mom? She fired back. With the words out, she wondered what she was trying to prove. Walker nodded. Without doubt. And my buddies were jealous that my mom was so cool. She'd hug them too. It's funny how alone a teenager feels even as they're pushing people away. His words brought back the pang of her own teen years. Funny how we forget that feeling as adults. She brushed her hair over her shoulder. So, are you two coming to the carnival this week? I'm not sure. She cocked her head. I'm pretty sure you're going to want to get your volunteer hours in at this event. Otherwise, you'll end up with gum duty at the end of the year. I can't show up for everything people assume I should attend. I've learned to say no to save my sanity. It's one evening, and the money raised is going to the nature walk field trip. You'd think that would be covered in the thousands I paid for tuition. Avery bristled. Do you have any idea how much it costs to run a school, let alone a privately funded institution with world-class teachers? No, but I have a feeling you're about to tell me. Savannah waltzed out of the changing room with a bouquet of bras hanging from her fingers. I'll take all of them. Walker groaned. Can you buy fifty so we don't ever have to do this again? Savannah shrugged. Avery snorted. It doesn't work like that. Walker's nicely shaped ears burned red. Thanks for your help. I think we can handle it from here. Whoa, what happened to hug your kid? Whatever. Good luck. Her words came out so full of sarcasm they could have stained the carpet. Not only had he dismissed her like the hired help, he hadn't apologized for spitting on her. She left without looking back and with her head held high. It wasn't Savannah's fault her dad was a jerk. With any luck, she'd gotten the better selection of jeans in the family. Yikes. What if walkers were the better selection? The thought sobered her. Evelyn approached, a shopping bag dangling from her forearm. At least her shopping buddy had been able to cross something off her list today. Avery still needed to find pants. Who was that? asked Evelyn, stretching her neck to see over Avery's shoulder. An awkward evening I'd rather not discuss. No. Evelyn had wheedled the details out of Avery as she'd stripped down next to the washing machine and thrown her clothes directly into the forget-this-ever-happened cycle. She couldn't put it behind her, though, it was too good of a story not to share. He's handsome, though. Trust me, handsome does not make the man. Evelyn linked their arms together again. You got that right. They headed for the escalators that would take them to the boys' section of the store. As they drifted upward, Avery couldn't help but go over the exchange she'd had with Walker. Not all of it was horrible. Most of it was, but not all. She'd finally gotten to use the Indiana Jones line. That was a plus. And he'd quoted the movie back to her. Too bad they couldn't have started with that on their date. Maybe things would have gone better. Chapter 9 That evening, Ben was in the kitchen with his laptop open. He liked to be where the scent of homemade French bread and lasagna permeated the room. Although, this was the third time in nine days they were eating lasagna. Alton, what gives? He pointed to the pan the chef pulled from the oven, the red sauce bubbly and the cheese lightly browned. Miss Savannah requested lasagna, so I make lasagna. Alton kissed the tips of his fingers and set the pan on the counter to cool as he retrieved the bread from the wall oven. I know I gave her permission to plan meals, but we need a limit on how many times she can have something in a row. Alton nodded. Perhaps once a week? Gads, no. We'd eat the same meal every Monday. 
Maybe she picks half the month, you pick the other. I need steak, Alton. Big, thick, tender steak with lots of pepper. Alton sniggered. Understood. I believe I can charm Miss Savannah into this plan. What are we charming my daughter into? asked Grace as she slinked into the room. The woman didn't walk, she moved as if her feet were clouds. It was one of the things that had captured Ben's attention the night they'd met. She looked like wealth. He'd thought she'd fit in in his world. She'd made herself comfortable there, but had made him decidedly uncomfortable in their marriage. We're working on trying new foods. He didn't have to ask how she got in. The staff were familiar enough with her impromptu visits that they no longer made a fuss. It saved them all from a bunch of unnecessary ruffled feathers. Besides, if he'd wanted privacy, he should have been in his office or master wing. Grace didn't venture near work, and she wasn't allowed in his personal space. Wonderful idea. Savannah should be ready to eat in Paris, Russia, or Japan. Not to mention Italia, added Alton. His Roman nose lifted slightly. Ah, Venice, Ben added, another quote from the Last Crusade, popping in his head. That was the third one since they'd returned from the world's most dreaded shopping trip. Grace flicked her fingers as if Venice were a fly she could chew away. Ben unconsciously began to compare Avery to his ex-wife. He couldn't help the grin on his face or the warm feeling in his chest that blossomed whenever he thought of Avery quoting Indiana Jones. She'd surprised him with the whole too small for the two of us quote in the middle of the department store. He thought their exchange went well, all things considered. Except for the end when she'd reminded him he'd have to shop in the ladies section at least once a year. He'd been so embarrassed he'd snapped at her. What are you doing here? He did his best to sound interested and not annoyed. I'm here to take Savannah to dinner. Why? Dinner with Grace wasn't on the family calendar that appeared at the tap of a button on any one of the screens posted throughout the house. He knew because he'd made sure their schedule was clear so he could recuperate from shopping. Being a father of a growing daughter was exhausting. Grace tapped her fake nails on the granite countertop. I'm canceling our spa weekend. And, as per our agreement, I have to make all cancellations in person. Thank the lawyers for that addendum. Ben would have spent his days making excuses for Grace if they hadn't seen into the future and suggest she have to be the one to cancel plans with Savannah. Their foresight had stopped him from being the bad guy in so many ways. At least Grace held up her end of the contract. It helped that the alimony payment was deducted if she didn't, but he'd like to think she'd do it anyway. Believing there was some good in her, some semblance of responsibility towards the life they created together kept him from filling her Prada purse with fresh lasagna. You're going to break her heart. She's been looking forward to this for weeks. The spa weekend was the icing on the rather ugly cake of having to move away from her friends. Grace had followed them to Seattle to be close to Savannah, but he suspected she needed a new start as much as the rest of them. Their divorce had been as civil and private as possible for a billionaire in the public eye. It had done more to ruin his reputation, as one who touted his amusement parks as family-oriented, than it did hers. She folded her hands together. Kids are resilient. Her flippant tone grated on his goodwill. Why do adults use that excuse for bad behavior? If your sister canceled a spa weekend on you, you'd not speak to her for a month. Grace's stiffened at the accusation. Savannah bounded in and slid to a stop behind them. Um, Mom? Grace swiveled in her chair and threw her arms out in welcome. Savannah, darling, you look adorable. They air-kissed. Ben's heart cracked. His ex-wife had as much warmth as the Terminator. Would it kill her to hug the girl? He'd been slowly sucked into Hades by her ice queen ways. One day, Quinn had appeared in his living room wearing a pair of sunglasses and a leather jacket. Come with me if you want to live, he'd said. Ben had gone and taken Savannah with him. I'm taking you to dinner tonight. 
Grace took Savannah's hand as if she were a five-year-old. Savannah looked to him for confirmation. Have fun. There's so many wonderful places to eat in this town. If you find a good spot, let me know. He smiled, hoping to put her at ease. Savannah rolled with the change in dinner plans. Alton? The chef stopped scrubbing a pot and gave the twelve-year-old his whole attention. Dinner smells wonderful. If you'll save me some, I'd like to take it for lunch tomorrow. Alton acknowledged her kindness with a nod. Of course, Miss Savannah. Have fun. Savannah nodded at her mother that they were ready to go. They set off, Savannah matching her mother's stride. She'd be a knockout, and she carried herself well. He just wished she didn't have to grow up so fast. The whole exchange depressed Ben. He walked around the counter, found a fork, and dug right into the pan of lasagna. Aheim, exclaimed Alton. Sorry, friend. I needed cheese. He offered Alton a fork. Join me in my rebellion. Alton dug out a hearty forkful and blew on it. Miss Savannah is smart. She knows who loves her. He sighed. Grace loves her as much as she can love another person. Even as he said the words, he knew it was a sad excuse. I should have chosen better. Someone with a shred of maternal instinct. Avery Croft and her long, curly hair popped in his head. She'd done well with Savannah at the shop, helping her feel grown up and not at all embarrassed about trying on her first set of bras, while Ben had made her feel like a child who wasn't ready to step into the next phase of life. He could learn a thing or two from Avery Croft. Chapter 10 The smell of caramel popcorn in the booth on Avery's right mixed with the smell of melting cheese from the booth on her left. The combination wasn't all that bad. When she closed her eyes and breathed in deeply, she could almost feel the bag of Costco brand caramel and cheddar popcorn in her hands. Curse Evelyn for bringing the wonderful temptation into her house. Avery hadn't drawn the caramel or cheddar popcorn stands for carnival assignments. She'd gotten a toddler game. The elementary-aged kids wanted to throw darts at balloons and shoot basketballs but the little ones enjoyed getting wet and earning prizes. Rubber duckies definitely didn't win her cool points with Landon. She should have signed up for a specific booth, but she'd done what she normally did and told them she'd work wherever they needed her. They'd stuck her and Claire here for the evening. Claire had run off to the bathroom and Avery was seriously looking forward to her turn to pee because she'd get to see the rest of the fundraiser. She smiled as a mom she didn't recognize brought over two-year-old twin boys who were so adorable in their matching jeans and polo shirts that her ovaries were screaming. Hi. Avery waved. You guys want to play? They nodded. Okay, so pick a duck, any duck you want. If he has a red belly, then you get a prize. They all had red bellies. They dove for the water in unison, nearly going headfirst into the pool. The mom saved one, and Avery was able to save the other. She laughed as she pulled him away from the water. Their mom looked less than thrilled. Sorry, guys. You have to stay outside of the pool. Or no prizes, griped their mom. Avery bit back her instinct to disagree. She'd hand over a whole bag of taffy to these two in a heartbeat. Besides, they'd likely be her only customers. She handed fishnets to each of the boys and let them get to work. When they netted their ducks, Avery exclaimed, You won. They grinned up at her with gap-toothed smiles and chubby cheeks. Seriously, ovaries. As she was saying goodbye to the adorable crew now happily munching on taffy, a commotion happened across the six-foot walkway that drew the attention of every person in the gym. The happy chaos of voices quieted, revealing the undertone of beeps and boops from the carnival games and the sound of hundreds of feet drumming against the gym floor. Principal Brown, in old-fashioned red and white striped swim trunks, made his way to the dunk tank directly across from Avery's booth. He waved his arms and bowed to those who whistled and teased. Avery stood in front of the pool to make sure no one was pushed into it on accident. 
The sheer number of students clutching tickets in their fists, ready to soak their principal, was a force. Claire managed to push her way through the crowd and added her body to the human shield. Can you believe this? I didn't realize he was so popular. Avery scooted closer so they didn't have to yell. He's been talking smack all week. Really building this up. Why? Our main sponsor for the trip pulled out. Her kids graduated and she wants to donate the money to their colleges instead. We have to cover the hotel with what we make tonight. Avery nodded. It happened. It wasn't great timing, but what could they do about that? Sometimes life handed you lemons and you had to climb into a dunk tank. At least they didn't ask me to sit in that frigid tank. She shuddered at the thought of a sudden plunge into the cold water. The kids would feel bad dunking you. We wouldn't make any cash. Avery got up on her tiptoes to see over the sixth grade boys hovering near the front. They wanted first shot. Landon's dark hair caught her eye. He wanted to be in with the older kids, to be part of their crowd. She hadn't seen him since they'd arrived, so it was good to know he'd stuck to the gym like she'd told him to. He ran with a group of five buddies who were dying to be the top of the elementary school pack next year. They thought they were so big and grown up already. It was adorable. The fact that she found it adorable was humiliating to Landon, but there wasn't much she could do about that. Her gaze traveled around as the first few contestants took aim and threw. Nothing got close to the target. The younger kids wanted to get back to playing games, so they peeled off the edges. Parents, grandparents, and nannies followed as time after time, students missed. Principal Brown hooted as he splashed his toes in the water. Looks like that's all that's going to get wet tonight. Come on, Trent, let's see you throw. Trent wound up and hurled the ball, missing by two inches. A collective groan went through the group. Avery's eyes landed on the man taking tickets at the front of the line. I don't believe it, she muttered. What? asked Claire. He came. Walker handed out softballs and took tickets. Savannah stood behind the tank and returned the balls after each player had exhausted his or her supply of turns. You got one ball per ticket, which made the dunk tank the most expensive booth at the carnival. Claire touched her elbow to get her attention. Who? Walker Wileby, blind date guy. That's him. Claire lasered in on Walker. I thought you said he was rude and ugly. Avery rolled her eyes. When a guy spits on you, he's ugly. Well, yeah. But look at him now. Avery turned away. She didn't need to look to know how hot he was. Like hot with a capital H and a tight T. Claire grabbed Avery's arm. It's Landon's turn to throw. Avery faced the tank again, not wanting to miss her son's chance to knock down her boss. Not that she had anything against Principal Brown. He was a decent enough guy, if not a little overly self-assured in his position. He thought he could run with the big dogs and liked to prove it every now and again by bragging about his lunch invitations from the wealthiest parents around the office. Avery, can you reschedule my one o'clock? I'm having lunch with the Dawsons at the roof. Landon pulled back and threw as hard as he could, missing by a foot. The guys in his group laughed. The sixth graders laughed harder. And meaner. Walker put up his hand, moving Landon out of the way and motioned for the loudest teaser to come on over and give it a try. Wrecker flipped his shaggy hair off his forehead and took a shot. His ball went too low. Walker let the next older kid go. And the next. Letting each heckler step in front of her son. Avery's blood boiled with each child that was put in line before hers. How dare Walker pull Landon out of line like that? He had just as much right as anyone to take his turn, and he had tickets to use. It didn't even look like these older kids were handing over tickets. Her hands balled into fists. Easy there, Mama Bear. Claire bumped her. Tonight's about family fun. 
Yeah, well, if he doesn't let my kid take a turn, I'm gonna start chucking rubber ducks at his head. She pulled off her jacket and tossed it to the floor like a matador issuing a challenge. Walker was oblivious to the fury building across from him. He joked with all the boys, ooed when they missed, clapped because they tried, and pretty much had the whole group wrapped around his finger. Except Landon. He was smiling and he laughed, but his eyes were empty. Avery's feet shuffled forward a few inches on their own. Her head told her to stay back and let Landon handle this, to not embarrass him in front of his friends. Her heart strained against her ribs in an effort to get her over there, where she could wrap her child in a warm embrace. As she scrutinized her kid for signs of permanent emotional damage, Walker made a big deal out of selecting him from the pack. He leaned over and whispered something in Landon's ear before handing him the ball and patting him on the back. Step back, guys. This is how it's done. Avery froze in fear. It's insane how quickly a mother can go from anger to paralyzing panic. One moment she was ready to let Ben have it, and the next she was clasping her hands before her and whispering a silent prayer. Dear Lord, if I've earned any blessings, send Luke to make that ball fly true. A little help from an angel father was exactly what Landon needed right now. If that ball hit the mark, it would be because of the Lord's grace. Avery had done her best to teach Landon how to throw a ball, it was one of those things all boys needed to learn. Like how she'd have to teach him to shave or drive a car. But she wasn't the best at sports, and when he could get it across the backyard, she figured that was good. Maybe not good enough for this. Landon pulled his arm back in a way she hadn't seen him do before. It looked like he was picking the ball up off a shelf behind him. He brought his arm up and over and released. The ball spun through the air, going, going, clank. The ball smacked the metal arm of the dunk tank, and Principal Brown screamed as he plunged into the frigid water with a giant splash. Yes. Avery threw her arms in the air. She quickly realized where she was, her place of work where her son had just dunked her boss, and dropped them again, tugging her shirt back into place. The smile stretching her cheeks wouldn't drop, though, no matter how many times she tried to rein it in. Mr. Brown surfaced and shook his finger at Landon, who laughed. The boys all got back in line, patting him on the back or giving knuckles. Now that one of them had done the impossible, they were determined that they could do it too. Landon tugged on Walker's arm. Walker leaned closer to hear him over the din. His lips said thank you. Avery could read them even from this far away. Walker patted Landon on the back and winked. Avery's heart swelled. Somehow, someway, Walker had made it possible for her son to be the hero. There was something attractive about a man who could make a boy feel ten feet tall. She wouldn't be asking him to teach Landon about dating or table etiquette, but she could give credit where credit was due. Her stomach flipped as her eyes raked over him in a way she'd been tempted to do before, but had done her best to avoid. He was a good-looking man. Claire was right. The polo shirt stretched just right over his arms and chest, and he did a pair of designer jeans justice. Walker stood tall and motioned for the next contestant to step right up. He must have felt her staring at him, because he glanced up and locked gazes with her. Avery put her hand over her heart and mouth, thank you as well. He nodded once and then was back to being one of the kids. For the rest of the night, Avery focused on her job and did her best not to think about Walker's clear brown eyes or the way he lost five years off his face when he laughed. She most definitely tried to not hear his laugh, because it was a good one. Deep. Throaty. Full. The kind of laugh that invited others to join in, even if they were determined not to. Which she was. By the end of the night, she would have welcomed a reason to laugh. Her feet throbbed, feeling as though they'd spread and strained her shoes limits. She sat on the floor, using the fishnets to scoop the duckies out of the water and pass them to Claire, who was drying them off. Her hands were dry, the skin tight from getting wet and airing out over and over again. She needed moisturizer and a hot bath, but neither was going to happen until she had this pool cleaned out. 
The janitorial staff was in charge of emptying the water, thank goodness. Griffin, the head janitor, wheeled up to the dunk tank with a pump of some kind and long hoses. He talked with Walker for a moment before Savannah took his hand and began to pull him away. Avery grinned. Every kid had their limit. She tried not to watch them as they headed her way, tried to act like she had no idea they were there and that she'd been watching them most of the night. Thankfully, Walker was oblivious to the darting looks in his direction. Night, Mrs. Croft, called Savannah. She glanced up at them, feigning surprise at their sudden appearance. Oh, are you two headed out? She immediately hated looking up at Walker. From this vantage point, his shoulders were so broad and his arms so muscular. Walker sighed. I think we've both had it. We'll probably sleep until noon. Savannah wrinkled her nose and stuck out her tongue, indicating that she didn't like that idea at all. Avery loved that she hadn't yet learned how to school her reactions, how to be careful about what she felt. Yet another plus in the good things about Walker column. We appreciate your help tonight. From the rumors circulating, we've reached our goal. You're going to love the field trip Savannah. Only the 5th and 6th graders get to go, and kids look forward to this for years. Walker shoved his hands in his pockets. We didn't sign up. Avery's hand dropped into the water, splashing her shirt. Why not? She reached for a towel and tried to dry off, again. That was Savannah's mom's weekend. Throwing the towel over her face and disappearing was an option, right? From the way Walker's and Savannah's lips turned down, mom was a sore subject. That will be way fun. She was lame. 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 Savannah's lower lip pouted out. Are you going on the field trip? She asked Avery. I am. My son is going too. You have a son? Walker blurted. I do. You didn't tell me that. He looked down at her, but it was more like he was looking down on her for not having disclosed the information on their date. You didn't tell me you had a daughter. Savannah giggled. Walker snapped his mouth shut. His head whipped to Savannah, and a cloud of fear passed over his face. Ah, uh, so he hadn't told her about the date. Or, if he had, he hadn't mentioned it was with the school secretary. Wonderful. She'd like to keep it a secret as much as anyone. The people she'd already told would be discreet. The whole experience could die a silent, secret death. Dad? Savannah hopped three times. Police. Can we go on the field trip? You get a full year's worth of parental volunteer hours if you go. Claire jumped in, making it apparent that she'd been eavesdropping all along. Avery threw her a get-your-own-conversation look. Now that's tempting, Walker admitted. Avery scrambled. She could not spend a whole weekend with Walker. That would be uncomfortable at best and a disaster at the worst. I'll have to check the roster on Monday. We might not have scheduled enough hotel rooms for another chaperone. But I'm certain we can get Savannah on the list. Savannah beamed up at her. Walker frowned. Check into it, would you? And I'm back to being the hired help. Certainly, Mr. Wileby, she clipped. They said their goodbyes. As soon as they were out of hearing distance, she rounded on Claire. Why would you do that? Because he's cute and there are sparks between you two. Yeah, which he doused with a mouthful of water in my face. You're obsessing. You would too. Well, stop it and start laughing. It was funny. Admit it. Avery threw up her hands in surrender. Fine. It's kind of funny. Claire snickered. Avery rolled her eyes. I'm going to find my son and get out of here. She got to her feet, dragging a large bag of rubber duckies behind her. She thrust the bag at Claire. You're in charge of putting these away. Claire laughed. 
Okay. Okay. I owe you that. But then we're even. No holding this field trip over my head. I won't have to hold it over you, because he's not going. I'll make sure of it. Avery rubbed her palms together. There were certain perks to being the secretary, and making sure she didn't have to spend the weekend with her awkward blind date in tow was one of them. Chapter 11 Avery made it into the office early on Monday thanks to a lot of prep on Sunday. She'd zoned out while she washed and ironed clothes, replaying that moment when Walker had lost it on their date. Each time, it got a little funnier and she was able to let go of her embarrassment. She had a great story, the kind she could send in for one of those online contests. Maybe she'd look into that. She could use the Amazon gift card, or whatever the prize was, for spring break. Landon always wanted to go somewhere big over spring break like his friends, the magic lamp parks were at the top of his list, but she didn't have the funds to set them up for a week. She might be able to do one day, though, if she packed a cooler with all their food and they didn't stay overnight. Even though tuition was free, she worked just to afford all the other stuff that went with going to an elite private school. At the end of the month, she had little to show for her hours in the office except for a bright kid, which was priceless. She'd do all of it all over again for him. Seattle's weather was on her side this morning, overcast but not rainy. She'd brought her rain jacket just in case and hung it on the coat rack by the principal's door. You would not believe my morning. Claire dropped her purse on her desk with a chink. Did you rob a candy machine? Avery joked. No. The guy at Joe Buck's only had quarters. She set a jumbo-sized cup on the desk. Avery's eyebrows climbed her forehead. If you drink that, I'll have to take you to the emergency room for a heart attack. Claire only drank small amounts of coffee when it was absolutely necessary because she was super sensitive to caffeine, like couldn't even eat a chocolate Easter bunny sensitive. This was my consolation prize for being the lucky lady who got $17.25 in change. She groaned and fell into her chair. He counted it three times. Avery was still laughing at the image of Claire tapping her foot while the cashier lost count and started over when they were both called into the principal's office. Principal Brown leaned back in his chair, his hands laced behind his head. Which of you did the attendance report this month? Claire lifted her fingers. Her beautiful, smooth face wrinkled as she cringed. I did. The report had to be hand-checked. Over 200 students. Okay, you've been punished enough. His heavily flushed cheeks lifted. Avery, I need you on a special project this morning. Avery squared her shoulders. What's that? We've had a generous donation from the Wileby family, and we're going to need to change hotels for the field trip this weekend. Chills brushed over Avery's arms. Her whole purpose this morning was to get here in time to make sure Walker wasn't going on the trip. I don't understand. Principal Brown got up and came around the desk, picking up two sheets of paper on his way. This is the list of rooms, names, and assignments, along with the phone number for the original hotel. We're going to have to change them all over to this new hotel. I'm sorry, but why can't we add a room to the other hotel to accommodate Mr. Wileby and his daughter? It seems like that would be easier. Easier? Yes. Cost-effective? No. Mr. Wileby owns the hotel, and he's offered us rooms at cost. Avery gritted her teeth. It wasn't often that she complained about the benefits the wealthy enjoyed, but there were times when the differences between her and someone like Walker stood out so boldly she wanted to stomp her foot and scream that life wasn't fair. If she had wanted to go last minute, she wouldn't have been able to offer a hotel as an incentive. What was this, Monopoly? You've landed on the field trip. Give up one hotel and, as a bonus, ruin Avery's weekend. The savings would give them a cushion for next year's trip as they work to find another sponsor, but still. Are you feeling all right? The principal leaned closer, the peppermint smell of his arthritis cream burning her eyes. I'm fine. 
I was just thinking through the steps. She plucked the pages from his grasp. I'll get right on this. Thank you. He turned, and she knew that was her cue to get out the door. What did he want, whispered Claire. Her eyes darted over Avery's shoulder to make sure the coast was clear. Avery explained the change in plans. Can you believe that guy? You don't have room for me. That's okay, I have a hotel. Claire considered her for a moment. He seemed devoted to Savannah. I guess he's doing this for her. Avery snorted. Sure. Appeal to my reasonable side. Wait. You have a reasonable side? Avery eyed the latte, seriously needing some kind of latte help to get through this morning. Don't touch my drink, Claire warned. Stop reading my mind. Claire held up a thin finger. I will after I say this. Avery threw her hands in front of her face as if she were bracing for impact. Go. I think the reason you don't want him there is because you're afraid you might like him. She smirked. Bull crap. The reason I don't want him there is because he's created a mountain of work for me. I have to update the itineraries and reprint them all. Do you have the link to the document on the portal? I have to change the online contact information for the parents. The school prided themselves on their commitment to communicating with the families. Claire had been in charge of writing the letter this year. Avery hadn't even looked at it yet. Nice way to change the subject. I'll email it to you. Thank you. She smiled sarcastically. With a shake of her head, she picked up the phone to call the new hotel and confirm their reservation before cancelling the first one. The whole time she verified names and the number of beds in a room with the poor hotel clerk who'd picked up the phone, Claire's statement about Ben being committed to his daughter rolled around in the back of Avery's head. If she had the ability to barter with a hotel for her son's happiness, even for one weekend, she'd do it. Especially when that kid was as down-to-earth as Savannah. The girl was adorable nine ways from Sunday. By the time lunch rolled around, Avery's sense of injustice had lessened to a dull roar. Walker's hotel was pretty sweet digs, the kids were going to love it. She was already picturing Landon's face when they walked into the lobby. He'd play it cool, but once they were in their room, he'd be jumping on the bed. She wouldn't have that if it wasn't for Walker. So, fine. She could be gracious. But that didn't mean she had to be Walker's best friend on this trip. They would pass in the halls and maybe on the hike, and that was it. She could handle seeing his handsome face and sculpted chest for a couple days. Like him? Ha! She could barely stand him. Chapter 12 the bus ride, even on a luxurious transportation vehicle, such as the one the school chartered for this excursion, was not an experience Ben wanted to duplicate. Savannah's hand had been wrapped around his arm for the majority of the ride, gripping his sleeve with trepidation. She was having trouble fitting in. He wanted to wrap his arms around her and tell her everything was going to be okay, but after overhearing the girls seated in front of them talk about everything from kissing boys to the latest tops designed by some French guy, he wasn't so sure. Savannah wasn't into all that stuff, yet. Thank goodness. Sure, she'd had a crush on a kid in her old school, but it was all giggles and not talking to each other. The girls in front of him had more experience kissing than Ben had at 15. He was seriously doubting his decision to enroll her at Royal Belfast. If the weekend didn't prove his assumptions wrong, then he would pull her Monday morning. The only other parent on the trip he knew was Avery. She'd sat in the front of the bus with the administrators. Her son had gotten on with his friends, claiming several rows of seats between them, plugging in their headphones, and zoning out. The bus pulled into the parking lot at a park and the principal got on the speaker. Welcome to our picnic dinner. We have baskets packed, and your groups are assigned a color. If you're a group leader, please come get your basket. Everyone else, please find your group leader. All baskets are packed according to special dietary needs. 
Ben thumbed through the thick welcome packet he'd been given before they left the school. We're the blue group. He smirked. Do you think they'll let us bang on pipes and drums? Avery rolled her eyes. That was a dad joke. He chuckled. Yeah, it was. Having kids was supposed to keep him young. So why did it make him feel so old sometimes? Let's get going. They stepped off the bus to find blankets scattered, one in each color, over a meadow of grass so green Ireland would be jealous. A playground with wood chips was off to the left, and a line of trees so thick the brothers Grimm would be inspired ring the far edge of the park. Hey, look! Mrs. Croft is on the blue blanket. Come on! Savannah took off at a sprint toward her new favorite human. Mrs. Croft could do no wrong. Mrs. Croft was so nice. And wasn't Mrs. Croft beautiful? Wait. Savannah had never said that. But as Ben walked slowly to the blue blanket, he couldn't deny that Avery looked especially good in a pair of tight jeans and a light sweater that hung perfectly over her curves. She was busy removing items from the large basket in the middle of the blanket. Her son sat on the farthest edge away from her, scowling. She handed him a sandwich and released him with a smile. He took off to be with his friends, who had climbed a tree and were eating in the branches, their legs dangling in the air. Savannah followed after him at first, but when she caught sight of where he was headed, she peeled away to go to the playground, where a group of girls her age had congregated. Around the park, parents gathered together. They were all couples. All of them. It looked like date night in the park. His face burned. He hadn't known he was supposed to bring a date. Avery kept her head down. Perhaps she was feeling the weight of her single stature as well. Ben dropped to the quilt, his knees bunching the fabric. You're in the blue group? Avery asked, her tone tight. He stuffed down another bad dad joke about the band name. Instead, he took the opportunity to be petty and throw her words from their ill-conceived date back at her. Hey, it's no picnic for me either. He swallowed his self-consciousness, noting that he'd lashed out at her because he felt inadequate. He needed to do better. I beg to differ. Her hand swept over the basket. This is literally a picnic. He laughed. Savannah would have called that another dad joke. He enjoyed it. Touché. She chuckled with him. Sorry. I'm a little tense. He got that. Instead of assuming she shared his reasoning, he wanted to know why she was tense, wanted to know more about her, wanted to see if he could get a whole laugh out of her. As a mom or as a secretary? Mom. She handed him a sandwich with his name on the baggie. It was several inches thick and made on artisan bread. There were also individual containers of fruit, a salad, flavored sparkling water, and cake. The non-hugger giving you trouble? He was my buddy for so long, now I'm lame. At least you still have your brains. Apparently, I lost mine when she turned twelve. Avery leveled him with a look. One word, unicorns. He pulled his head back. In my defense, a person needs a passport to go into that department. I don't speak cup size. He dropped his gaze, mortified that he'd used the term cup size in public and in front of a beautiful woman. Avery laughed, a true, relaxed hey, we're having a conversation laugh. His stomach warmed and his body tingled with an awareness of her that hadn't been there before. How long have you been divorced? The laughter trickled away like a stream in the August heat. She plucked at the corner of her sandwich, pulling the bread apart. I, uh, that is, Luke died five years ago. Sorry, he muttered. He always said the wrong thing around Avery. The awkward silence that filled the space had the two of them looking in different directions. She took a small bite of her sandwich. You're divorced, then? Grateful she'd asked instead of him volunteering the information like a girl saying I'm free Friday night, he did his best to make normal conversation. 
11 years. 11? So Savannah was an infant? Yep. She has no memories of me and her mother together, which is probably good for her emotional development. He joked, but the truth outlined his words. And, you're still single? She regarded him as one would a stranger at the mall who was trying to sell a cellular phone. He didn't like that one bit. You don't sound surprised enough, he countered, well, more like challenged. You spit on me. That was literally the worst date of my life. So, no. Not surprised. She wasn't at all joking. I coughed. On you. He shoved the second half of the sandwich back in the bag. And you ordered without me. She made a sound of disbelief. You were 21 minutes late. And you took forever in the bathroom. She glared. You never apologized. She pushed off the blanket, brushed her hands on her hips. I think we need a timeout. She stopped off. Ben watched her go, hating that he could admire the view and still be angry at Avery. This woman was a thorn in his side. If he didn't want to strangle her, then he was thinking about how those curves would fit against him. Ben needed to walk, so he took off too. He didn't make it three steps before he was a square peg in a round hole. Instead of wandering through the other parents, making small talk, he headed for the playground to find Savannah. As they'd milled about the parking lot before boarding the bus, he'd been asked to look into three investment opportunities of a lifetime. Maybe Savannah would hang out with him and he could finish his dinner in peace. He didn't see her among the girls gathered at the top of the slide, chatting. So he walked around the equipment. Ducking to see inside a tunnel, he found Savannah, but she wasn't alone. Avery had folded herself inside there as well. What the heck? That was his daughter. Wanna go on the slides? Avery asked. Ben scooted so he couldn't be seen but could still hear every word. It helped that the tunnel was made of plastic and there was an amplifying effect. Nah, the resolution in Savannah's voice about tore Ben in half. He glared up at the platform where the girls congregated. They were the same ones that had sat in front of them on the bus. Not once had they turned around to invite Avery to be a part of their group or even acknowledged her existence as they left Seattle behind. You know, my grandma taught me something once. It's kind of a trade secret in our family, we keep it among us girls. But, Avery sighed dramatically, I don't have a girl to pass it on to. Can I share it with you? Ben leaned closer, his hand on the cool plastic. When you don't smile, people think you're stuck up. A small gasp came from Savannah. A smile tells people you want to be friends. Got me through junior high. You should try it this weekend and see if it works. Her information was met with silence. Besides, you have one of the prettiest smiles I've ever seen. It's a shame to hide that away. My mom says I have her smile. Savannah's voice was small, timid about mentioning her mother to another woman. Ben leaned heavily on the tube, needing the support when facing his daughter's vulnerabilities. Then she must be stunning too, replied Avery. She had this quality when she spoke with Savannah that Ben had a hard time putting a name to. Honesty? That was almost right. An old scripture phrase popped into his head, without guile. That was it. She was pure. There were no hidden agendas. In this case, she wanted to make Avery feel good about herself, to let her beauty shine forth. Which made it easy to like her at the moment. If the way to his heart was through his daughter, then Avery was working her way in whether she wanted to or not. She probably did not. He couldn't blame her. In fact, he didn't want her to want to be in his heart. She drove him crazy, and the two of them couldn't be together for more than three minutes without blowing up. She had a point, though, about him not apologizing. He'd skipped over that piece of etiquette, hoping she'd let it go. Well, she hadn't. Which meant he needed to do something about his manners. 
every phone in the park dinged simultaneously. Before Ben could check the text message, he heard Avery moving around in the tube. That's the call for the ice cream sundaes. Come on, you can help me with the whipped cream. Ben shuffled backwards, trying to get out of there, before either female saw him. His heel caught on the teeter-totter and he went down, arms windmilling. Several guys rushed to his aid. They surrounded him, pulled him up, and brushed off his clothing. In the middle of there are you okay? And man, that was crazy comments, he spied Avery and Savannah pass by. Savannah was walking so close to Avery she almost tripped her. The two of them were cute together. If he did end up pulling Savannah from the school, she'd miss her friend. And even though he'd be absolutely nuts to admit it, he'd miss her too. They made it to the hotel without a single opportunity for Ben to apologize in private. Avery did a fantastic job of avoiding him. Ben and Savannah had a suite all to themselves. He'd had his assistant, Herb, call and make sure it was all arranged. Not that he didn't trust the school to take care of things, he just liked to know what was going on. Besides, the hotel was taking a loss having the school use 45 rooms at cost. He should be in the know. Most of the kids bumped with their parents, but there were several who didn't have a parent or guardian along. They were grouped together with a parent volunteer. Savannah would have been assigned to Avery if he hadn't come. She might have enjoyed being with a woman who valued her thoughts and tuned into her concerns. Ben wouldn't mind some time with a soft, caring woman who happened to have dark, curly hair and olive skin. The more he saw of Avery, not the angry woman he seemed to bring out, but the tender, gentle woman he'd seen with Savannah, the more he could imagine her in his life. Talking over family dinners, coordinating soccer schedules, and banking in his kitchen. He'd bet she played music when she baked. She'd listed baking on her Capture My Heart profile, and he wanted to know if she could make pumpkin bread. Pumpkin bread was his favorite sweet treat, a little cream cheese frosting went a long way. Savannah settled into the middle of the king-sized bed in her room and flipped on the Disney Channel. Ben paced as he checked his emails and phone messages, trying to get thoughts of Avery out of his head. There weren't any activities scheduled for this evening with the group, so he decided to hit the gym. They were hiking up to 20 miles tomorrow, but he needed to clear his head tonight. More like clear Avery out of his head tonight. He made sure Savannah was set, double-checked the lock behind him, and headed down the hall to the elevator. While he was on the way, his brother called. Sup? he answered. Tweaking the dragon roll. What are you up to? I'm headed down to lift. Oh. Who ticked you off? He hit the elevator call button. Avery. Feeling as though she was right behind him, he twisted to look over his shoulder. The hallway was clear, and he breathed a sigh of relief. The elevator opened and he slipped inside and pressed the button for the lobby, leaning against the back wall. You should have heard her. Ben lifted his voice an octave. Divorced eleven years? Something seriously wrong with you. Quinn snickered. He went on, trying to convince himself as much as Quinn. As if a single man must automatically want to be married. I like my life, thank you very much. Spit on her again, Quinn cheered. You're a horrible person. Quinn's version of support was less than helpful. He laughed lightly. Give her a break. You're not an easy guy to love. Whoa there, Tonto. Who said anything about love? I did. But the panic in your voice makes me want to know what you think about it. Small beads of sweat broke out on Ben's forehead. And now your silence tells me all I need to know. You like her. I like her more when she's not with me. That was the truth. The doors slid open and he left the elevator, only to stumble into a group of boys loitering in front of the doors. What's this? he asked, pulling the phone away from his face. Landon spoke up. He was taller than the other kids, and somehow, when you're a boy, height makes you the leader. 
He wore the responsibility well, looking Ben in the eye as he talked. Principal Brown says we can't leave the hotel and they won't let us play ball inside. Twelve heads hung low in disappointment. The smallest kid held up a football as if it were evidence to their great sadness. These were the same kids who had flooded the dunking booth, spending all their tickets for an opportunity to drop the principal. Ben couldn't stand to see their dejected faces. What were eleven-year-old boys supposed to do cooped up in a hotel for the night? At least these guys wanted to do something active. I have an idea. He stepped to the front desk and had a quick conversation with the manager on duty. Her name tag said Jenny, and she had a beauty pageant quality about her with big white teeth and shiny lips. She hurried around the desk and motioned for them all to follow her down the hall. Where are we going? asked a red-headed boy. Name? Ben pointed at his chest. Rigby. He sniffed loudly. We're going to play ball. Ben reached for the football and tossed it in the air. Jenny waved her key tag in front of the lock, and the doors clicked open. Let me just get the lights. She disappeared into the dark cavern. The kids huddled closer to him. He couldn't help but grin. They were in for quite the surprise. Jenny bumped into something and grunted. Things clattered. You okay? Ben called into the void. I'm good. A moment later, the lights flipped on to reveal the grand dining room in all its glory. The tables had been folded and leaned against the north wall for storage between events. The chairs were on racks in the corner. A durable and only somewhat stylish carpet with gold accents covered the floor, while the walls were covered with blood-red drapes. Nine chandeliers could be lowered at the press of a button, but thankfully they were flush with the twenty-foot ceiling now. Whoa, said Landon. Jenny righted the chairs she'd bumped in the dark. It's all yours, Mr. Wileby. Is there anything else I can do for you? If any of the parents come looking for their kids, send them this way. You got it. She gave him a thumbs up and slipped out the door. Ben smacked his hand against the pigskin. Let's do some drills, fellas. They poured into the room, picking up speed as they went, running to get the lay of the land and stretch their legs. The carpet muffled the noise. In short time, he had them doing high knees using the design in the carpet to warm up. They stretched, and he had to reach into the Wayback Machine to remember the pregame warm-up he'd done in high school. As his lower back protested a twist, he realized why Savannah thought he was so old. No more coasting on his youth. They divided into fair teams, with him as the quarterback for both sides. He didn't mind hanging in the middle of the line at all and had a great time. He made sure each kid had a chance to receive and run down the field. Some of them made it farther than others, but they all had huge grins. The kids surprised him with their chatter. They didn't tear one another down. He had to hand it to the school for that one. When he had gone for the tour, the principal raved about how they taught the children to interact in positive ways starting in kindergarten, and that those lessons carried on into adulthood. It wasn't that the boys weren't competitive. They were that but they were respectful of one another. If only the girls were so easy to get along with. Savannah needed friends. He should have brought her down here. She wasn't a slouch at football. Ouch! Ben's head whipped around at the cry of pain. Landon was on the ground, holding his ankle. His face was twisted and his eyes pressed shut. Ben hurried over and dropped to a knee followed by the rest of the gang. What happened? My shoe caught in the carpet when I turned. The kids crowded around, blocking the light. They asked Landon a half-dozen questions at once. He didn't respond to them. Instead, he looked at Ben for help. Ben picked up Landon's foot and was hissed at. He took off his shoe and sock, handing them to Rigby. Hold these, Rig. Rigby stood taller, proud to be of assistance and to have a nickname. His red face fairly beamed with pleasure. 
Ben carefully felt around the ankle with his fingertips. The tendon was slightly swollen, but Landon didn't flinch when he rotated the joint. Looks like a sprain. Not too bad. We need to get you back up to your room. Ah, moaned the kids. Ben chuckled. There'll be more games in the future, guys. Brady and T, do you know how to do a forearm carry? They shook their heads. He quickly showed them how to hold one another's forearms to make a seat for Landon. Landon wrapped his arms around their necks and sat down so they could carry him to the elevator. They all fit into the elevator, though the smell that bloomed with so many sweaty bodies in a small space was something awful. Ben was embarrassed to know he added to the stench. Worse yet, he was bringing it to Avery's door. She was such a pretty lady, the kind that didn't look like she ever got dirty, was always put together, or maybe it was the softness to her face. She didn't have harsh lines. Considering what she must have gone through losing her husband and the father of her child, she could have turned bitter, and he wouldn't blame her one bit. The boys made enough noise that the whole hallway knew they were waiting outside Avery's door. When she opened it, her eyes met Ben's and his breath caught in his chest. She had her hair up in a high ponytail and her makeup off, revealing a youthful, fresh face. Her soft cheeks would fit perfectly in the palms of his hands. With everyone trying to tell her what happened at once, her attention was tugged away and Ben was finally able to think clearly. Can we come in? Avery blinked. Of course. She stepped back, and the kids rushed in as though they'd broken through a dam. T and Brady had to turn sideways to get in the door with their cargo. Avery's eyes darted to Landon's foot and then to Rigby, who still carried his shoe. What happened? She got twelve answers all at once. He turned too fast. He busted his ankle. He can't walk. She held up her hands for silence. What? She pointed at Landon for him to answer. I was running and looking over my shoulder and my foot caught and I twisted my ankle. He spewed it out like a confession in church. Avery dropped to her knees in front of him. Oh my gosh! She reached for his foot, but he pulled it away. Ben already looked at it. Ben looked at it? She was on her feet and rounding on him, ready to pounce. He grasped her upper arms, a shock blowing through his system as his brain registered that her skin was indeed warm and velvety. Just as he'd known it would be. Play it cool, he whispered to himself, though those were the words he had intended for her. In front of the guys, he added in case she wasn't thinking clearly. Her eyes had glassed over. He didn't know if it was because she was afraid for her child or if she'd been affected by his touch as much as he'd been affected by hers. She nodded mutely. They stared at one another for an extra second than was acceptable before Ben mentally forced his hands to let her go. He stepped into the bathroom, being hit with the scent of Avery's vanilla body spray. The bottle was right there on the counter. Next to the ice bucket. He needed some space. Focusing on the task at hand, he stepped into the bathroom to get a moment away from Avery. The room was filled with the scent of her vanilla body spray and did little to help him think clearer. He needed a dunk tank full of ice water. Ice bucket. He snagged it, lined it with the plastic bag folded in the bottom, and then turned to toss it out to lay ten. Avery was helping Brayden and T set Landon on the bed. Lay ten, you and Trey go get some ice. It's at the end of the hall. They nodded and took off. I'm sorry, guys. I ruined the game. Landon's eyes stayed glued to the bedspread. Avery looked around at all the downcast faces. You know what? You can watch a movie here. I have snacks. The kids looked to Ben, silently asking permission, or maybe if it was cool to hang out with the school secretary. It was most definitely cool. He nodded encouragingly. Soon, the two were back with ice and the kids took up spots on the two queen beds. Landon was in the middle of one, his foot propped up on a pillow and the ice bag on top. Avery handed the remote to Rigby, 
who solemnly found them a Marvel movie. Once everyone was settled, Ben motioned to the door. I'd better get going. Avery followed him to the doorway. She chewed her bottom lip and continually glanced over her shoulder at the pile of boys. Sorry about getting so upset. The apology rolled off her tongue so easily, he should have been able to say sorry as well. He just didn't feel like it was the right time. If he brought it up now, she might shut him out again. Her eyes were open, real, unguarded, and he liked the way it made her seem approachable, friendly, even. He lifted a hand and brushed away her concern. I get it. So. What do I do here? She jerked her head toward the kids. I don't want to mess this up. Feeling brave, he ran his hand down her arm. The gesture was supposed to reassure her that she had this, but he half expected her to jerk away from him. She didn't, and his heart rate triple. He cleared his throat. All you have to do is feed them and they'll stick around. Got it? She nodded, setting her chin with determination. I can do that. I overpacked on snacks. Great. Boys are easy, let them pig out and they'll love you. She hugged herself. Thanks for looking out for my kid. Anytime. He's great. That's on you. Her smile brightened the entire room and knocked him back a step. She'd said Savannah had a great smile, and she did. That girl could get anything with her smile. But Avery's smile affected him in a completely different way. It was harder to obtain, and it was the smile of someone who had known great sorrow and still found joy in life. Wow. Just wow. I'll see you tomorrow. Yep. He focused on lifting his foot and getting into the hallway. Bemused, he ambled to the elevator. Since when did being a good mom become so attractive? Because momness looked good on Avery. Chapter 13 Avery Avery snuck around the hotel room, gathering her phone and running shoes. She wrote a note on the pad on the side table for Landon, telling him she was going out for a run. She needed to get out of the hotel, and especially out of the room. It smelled like a dozen preteen sweaty boys had camped there overnight. They hadn't. Their parents had started calling them around 11, and the last one trickled out at 11.30. Still, she should buy an air freshener to save the poor maids. Once his buddies left, Landon filled her in on the whole football game, from being told they had to stay in the hotel to walk her saving the day. Or was it Ben? Landon called him Ben, but his Capture My Heart profile had said Walker. She double-checked it this morning. She tied her shoes as she waited for the elevator. A soft ding told her it had arrived, and she hopped up, ready to run off some of her mom high. She'd nailed it last night with the guys. Inside the elevator was Walker slash Ben, wearing high-end workout clothing. She wondered if he packed more than she had and if he was a high-maintenance man. How'd it go? he asked, his eyes bright and interested. Avery hugged herself happily. I'm out of junk food and my kid probably has a sugar hangover like no other, but he sent me a covert text thanking me for not being embarrassing for once. They laughed together. She quieted hers so she could enjoy his laugh. It was profound and rumbly, like it came from deep inside of him where there weren't walls or defensive measures. For a moment, they watched the numbers tick down. Avery slid her phone into the armband and secured it around her bicep. Anyway, thanks for the advice. It worked out. Question, do you want me to call you Ben or Walker? She slapped the Velcro in place. He gave her that Harrison Ford smile again. You can call me whatever you want. She lifted an eyebrow at his flirting. With a dry mouth, she responded, then I'll call you Indiana. As in Jones? He bobbed his head as if the idea of being named after the famous action-adventure character suited him just fine. We named the dog Indiana, she quoted. His mouth fell open in shock. How did I miss that line? She covered her mouth as she giggled. 
he scowled, creating two lines between his eyebrows. Sorry, you walked into that one. He lifted a shoulder. I'm going to have to watch the movie again tonight. I don't think Savannah has seen that one. She gasped and splayed her hand over her chest. What kind of a parent are you? One who is seriously lacking in educating his child. She'd scared her tongue and forced her gaze away from the laughter in his eyes. Trying to bring herself down a few notches, she asked, is Savannah okay? She'd found the girl in the tunnel alone the day before, and they'd had a nice chat. Moving was hard for kids, and the girls her age had been together since kindergarten. She's still trying to find her place. She'll get there. She's an amazing person, that's on you. Avery poked him in the arm. The tight, muscly arm. Her eyes traveled from his shoulder to his wrist, noting the bulges she'd not seen in all his dress shirts. Ben cocked his head, a smile tugging at his lips. Dang it. He'd caught her looking at him. Like, looking looking. That was mortifying. Her mom's involved enough that I have to share some of the credit. Like 50-50? More like 8515. She has her smile, Avery offered. 8020, Ben. Ben grinned. They were supposed to be on a luxurious mother slash daughter spa weekend, and instead Savannah's here, feeling alone. Avery pressed her clenched fist to her chest. Feeling skin there, she realized how revealing her running top was and made an effort to cover her cleavage with her palm while trying not to look like she was covering cleavage. Sheesh. She'd never thought about it before, but Walker slash Ben made her aware not only of his body, but of hers. For example, her mouth was dry, 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 and her palms were slick. Not to mention there was something funny going on with her stomach, like it was on a whole different elevator that kept dropping quickly. Ben. She tried his name and found that she liked it. Walker was the guy who had made her miserable for a night. But Ben? Ben was a decent man who'd made sure a bunch of kids had the chance to run around last night. She could get used to having a man like Ben around. What were they talking about? Kids. Oh yeah. Kids need to know they're important. They don't see the hundreds of things we do for them every day as a sacrifice. It's our job to take care of them, right? It's like our attention and time are the only currency they understand. Agreed. He dove into her eyes, making her feel as if she were standing before him with nothing to hide. The air grew warm and swirled around them, brushing against her skin, encouraging her to step closer. The elevator doors dinged open. They stayed put. It became difficult to gather a deep, satisfying breath. Ben leaned, or maybe that was her but they were close enough that she could smell his aftershave. A lady bustled inside. Going up? She pressed the button for the second floor. Ben's hand shot out, stopping the door from closing. Getting off. Avery ducked her chin and walked out, trying not to feel the woman's glare. Are you going to the gym? Ben asked pointing down the hallway. I'm going to run outside. She pointed to the front doors. Be safe. You too. She waved and left, berating herself. You too, really? Like he needed to be safe in the hotel gym. Dumb. She was so out of flirting practice, she was embarrassing herself. Not that she was flirting with Ben. That would be a bad move. She sped up her walk and then broke into a light jog. The hotel was in an upper crust area of town. Like Ben would own a seedy hotel. The guy was rich with a capital R. Come to think of it, his profile on Capture My Heart hadn't said anything about being a billionaire. That was weird. What was also weird was that he was on the app in the first place. He had to know dozens of eligible women, models, actresses, other billionaires, and a few millionaires. So what was the deal? Her phone rang, and she tucked earbuds in before answering. She liked to talk while she ran. 
Sure, the magazine said that being able to hold a conversation was a sign that you weren't pushing yourself hard enough, but that wasn't the point of running. Running was for her peace of mind. It centered her and allowed the stresses to drop away. Hi, Evelyn. She greeted her house sitter for the weekend. Your plant is dead. That could not be possible. Although Evelyn was notorious for killing flora of all kinds. Her side of the yard was a patch of grass that she paid someone to mow. I've been gone for less than 24 hours. It was droopy before you left. How's the field trip? Not horrible. She hadn't filled Evelyn in on the Ben drama that had happened since the blind date. It just wasn't something she felt comfortable disclosing. Landon sprained his ankle. I'm worried about the hike today. You baby him too much. Can he walk on it? I think so. He'd made it to the bathroom the night before with only a small limp. The ice helped a lot. Then he can walk it off. A battle waged inside Avery. Mother Bear usually won, but there was this new contender, awesome mom, who came out strong. She was championed by Ben's advice and example. You're probably right. Of course I'm right. Avery rounded a corner. On her right was a small grocery store with a cute green and white awning out front. Her snacks were completely gone. On the off chance the kids decided to hang out in her room again that night, she wanted to be prepared. Ben had been right, as long as there was food lying around, the kids were content. Although, after watching them plow through cookies, she felt like his advice should have been, you need to feed them or they'll eat you. Tell me about book club. What did I miss? She gripped the steel bar of a shopping cart and headed inside. Her credit card was tucked into her phone case on her arm. She'd have to carry everything back, so she needed to be smart about what she bought. Trudy took that cat of hers back to the vet. What for this time? She said he was running a fever. More like Trudy's fevering for the vet. This was one of their favorite topics of conversation, the will they or won't they of Trudy and her handsome vet. The man was good with animals and apparently sweet on the eyes. Trudy had tried to get a picture of him one time but had fumbled her phone and broken the screen. Book club laughed about it for months. Anytime someone came in with a cracked screen, they all begged to know who the hot guy was that caused it. For most of the ladies, there actually was a hottie involved. Avery bit her lip, wondering if she should try to get a picture of Ben this weekend. Would that be weird? The cat's fine, by the way. I figured as much. Avery walked past an end cap and slowed down. There were packets of clay masks and hair masks and hand masks, whatever those were, on display. An idea struck, and she grabbed several of each. In a quick step, she'd picked up two bottles of nail polish as well. Honey, I gotta go. The UPS man just pulled up. I just wanted to give you the bad news about your plant. I appreciate you calling right away. It would have been an awful shock to come home to. Not really, but when you asked a neighbor to watch over things, and she took that job as seriously as Evelyn, you had to play along or you'd lose your house sitter. Avery took a deep breath of clean air. That was one thing the rains in Seattle did that she'd never complain about, they washed the pollutants from the sky so cloudless days were bright blue beautiful. There was something different about mountain air, though, it was crisp and sharp. The salty sea was out of each breath. Instead, she caught the scent of fir trees, pine, dirt, and every once in a while, the brush of wildflowers. There was a patch of them just below the trail, the maroon and red sticking out against the lush green grass and the muted gray rocks scattered across the dry riverbed. Is this the Meadow Valley? asked Landon. Methow, she corrected. Yes. We made it. Landon grinned, his whole countenance radiating victory. He'd started out the hike strong, hanging with his buddies at the front of the pack. But as the day wore on, his ankle wore out and he opted to go at a slower pace. Avery was glad she was alone on the hike so she could keep an eye on him. 
She'd checked the joint, and though there was no additional swelling, it had developed a bruise. The discoloration was a good sign. The pediatrician had once said that outward signs of injury were better than pain with no apparent reason for it. I'd say the view was worth the trouble. Ben and Savannah came up behind them. His eyes were on Avery, making her puzzle over the meaning behind his words. Was he paying her a compliment, saying she was beautiful, or had he meant Methow Valley was worth giving up a weekend's income from the hotel? Unsure how to respond, she looked away, making the situation all the more awkward. How are you feeling? Savannah asked Landon. Landon shrugged. All right, I guess. Savannah, bless her, tried to engage Landon in conversation. Do you know what Yarrow looks like? I have almost everything else for my journal, but I couldn't find that one. Landon perked up. I think there was some back this way. He flicked his hand, inviting her to go with him. They fell in step together. So where do you guys live? Landon asked. Avery grinned at Ben. Her boy was making conversation with a girl. This was, like, huge. So far, his interactions with girls, the ones she knew about, included cootie fights and throwing mud at them. Ben grinned back. In the cove, Savannah answered. What about you guys? Ballard. Savannah laughed and shook her head. I have no idea where that is. Landon lifted a shoulder. You're new. You'll figure it out. Seattle's fantastic. You're going to be so glad you moved here. He pointed to a yellow plant. That's Yarrow. Hey, have you guys tried the ice cream at the waterfront? The stuff inside by the arcade? Savannah broke off a stick with a bunch of yellow flowers on the end. Not yet. Her nose wrinkled at the pollen that filled the air around her. Mom, we have to take them. Landon turned back to Savannah without waiting for her answer. We can get clam chowder too. They have this window that you order at, and it comes in a lunch sack and it's so warm. Does it have curry in it? Savannah asked. Avery turned her ear towards them. The breeze was making it hard to listen in without being conspicuous. Landon twisted up his nose. I don't think so. Why? My dad's allergic to curry. Avery stopped in her tracks, remembering Ben's outrageous behavior at the table, the rinsing his mouth and spitting, his red, watery eyes. How had she not noticed an allergic reaction? She turned to Ben. The French fries. They had curry. She wanted to smack her forehead. You were having an allergy attack. That's why you sp, coughed? He rubbed the back of his neck. My throat was tingling and I sort of freaked out. I'm usually more cautious. Why didn't you tell me? She smacked his arm. Because I already looked like an idiot showing up late, and then I coughed all over you. There was no coming back from that. She shook her head at him. I would have understood. I would have helped you. You're lucky your throat didn't close off. I had an AP in the car. Geez, Ben. She smacked him again. He held up his hands. I'm fine. See? I can breathe and everything. He sucked in dramatically. She shook her finger at him. You're lucky. The kids moved back to the trail and walked together in front of the adults. They all merged to one side to allow another group from the school to make their way up the path. That's the last group. As long as we're in front of them, we're doing great, Avery told Landon. He'd be mortified to come in last. They walked for a few minutes. Each time Avery paused to take a picture or two with her phone, Ben waited for her. Their silence was comfortable, but a question nagged at Avery. She scratched her neck, the need to ask getting uncomfortable. When she thought she'd burst, she said, Okay, I'm just going to throw this out there, you don't have to answer. Go on. 
she bit her lip. His deep brown eyes fairly twinkled as he anticipated her question. The sight of it made butterflies awaken inside of her. She pressed her flat hand over her belly. The feeling was so odd. She didn't know if she'd ever experienced that with Luke. Maybe the first few times he'd kissed her. Certainly on her honeymoon. But they'd been together for so long that there wasn't much new in their courtship or marriage. Um. So you live in the cove? Yeah. Well, on your dating profile, it didn't say anything about you being rich. His ears tinted pink. Like he was embarrassed to use that word to describe himself. A humble billionaire? No way. Why lie? He chuckled. I was testing the app for a friend. Dawson Fitzwilliam. His company owns the app. Anyway, he thought that if women knew who I was, then it would skew the results. She laughed. Oh my gosh. Did you tell him about our date? He shook his head. I've been able to avoid his calls so far. Oh my gosh. She covered her mouth with her hands and widened her eyes. I told him. How? She dropped her hands to her throat. There was a survey after the date was completed. I told him everything. Ben tipped his head back and laughed. So much for my reputation as a ladies' man. She giggled. Have you ever had a worse date? Never. She lifted an eyebrow in challenge. I promise. You were, and hopefully will always be, my worst first date. She took a bow. It's an honor I don't take lightly. He turned his chin up in a Superman pose. What about me? Technically, you're my only first date. Really? How did that happen? I grew up next door to my husband. We were playmates, best friends, and eventually married. I can't remember a time when we were two separate people. We were always Avery and Luke, Luke and Avery. You're Avery now. I am. She smiled. It's strange. And yet, it feels like this is how it was meant to be. We had 25 years together. How many couples can say that? He smiled in response. She wondered what was behind that smile. I'm not judging you and your ex-wife. I didn't think you were. Oh. So she hadn't stuck her foot in her mouth the first time, but it was firmly wedged in there now. Mom. Come see this. Landon called from up ahead. She'd lost sight of him as the conversation had gotten better. That had never happened to her before. She'd never enjoyed something so much that she'd gotten lost in it. Coming. She hurried ahead. One of these days, she'd figure out how to talk to Ben without making an idiot of herself. Chapter 14 Showered and properly turned out in their pajamas, Ben and Savannah flopped onto the king-sized hotel bed. He was sore in places he hadn't known could be sore. Savannah had slept on the bus on the way back and was bright-eyed. Wanna watch a movie? he asked as he brushed her silky hair off her face. She sighed. Nah. Order room service? No thanks. Play a video game? Savannah propped herself up on her elbows. Can we go see what Avery and Landon are doing? Ben blew out his cheeks. That would be tricky. They'd hiked the whole way back together, trading stories and getting to know one another. He'd enjoyed it very much. Would do it again tomorrow. But Avery had made a hasty exit off the bus, and he didn't want to force himself on her. They're probably tired. Landon limped his way into the hotel. I don't think we should bother them. Her face fell and she dropped down again. There was a knock at the door that had them exchanging looks. Did you order food? he asked. Avery was an expert at room service delivery. She shook her head, her lips pressed tightly together in seriousness. 
He crossed the room and swung open the door to find Avery with two allied girls, one on each side of her. They were all in pajamas and had their hair up in messy knots. Avery looked especially cute with her freshly washed face. Hi, she breathed. He liked the idea that he'd taken her breath away. Leaning against the door in his best casual attitude, despite the thump-thump of his heart, he said, Hey. What's this? She gave him the same play at cool look he'd given her the other night. We're here for the spa night. She held up a grocery bag. He pulled his eyebrows down, ready to ask her what she was talking about. She didn't give him a chance. Instead, she pushed past him. Thanks for inviting us up, Savannah. The two girls followed her, their eyes avoiding him but taking in everything else. Savannah sat up in her knees. Sure. She smiled shyly at the girls. His daughter was much better at playing along with things than he was. Ben recognized the girls from the hike today. They were with a group whose parents hadn't come, so they'd been assigned to a chaperone. Ben shut the door and followed them into the bedroom. He glanced around quickly to make sure things were put away and snagged a towel off the back of the chair, tossing it under the sink in the bathroom. Savannah, this is Sophie and Margot. I think they're in your class. We are, said Margot. Hi. Hi. Savannah replied with a small wave. Avery pointed to her smile, and Savannah added one to her own expression. Thanks for coming over. Sophie grinned. Thanks for inviting us. This is sick. Everybody voted to watch Grease in our room. Again, moaned Margot. Avery dumped the bag out on the bed. Packet spread around. I have all the fixins for a ladies' night of pampering. The girls dug into the assortment of shiny packages, reading the labels out loud. Face wash. Smoothing cream. Glamour pack. The list went on. Are your feet sore? Avery asked them. I thought they were going to fall off, said Margot. I wanted mine to fall off, added Savannah. Her voice wasn't as strong as if she were talking to a trusted friend. Almost like she was testing her sense of humor out on these girls. Sophie nodded. Let's start with the foot soak. Avery picked up several packets and headed for the bathroom. This tub is perfect. Ben hovered in the doorway, feeling helpless. The water ran for a few minutes while the girls chatted. They asked where Savannah was from, why she moved there, if she liked the school, Seattle, and any boys in their class. They then proceeded to squeal and screech as bubbles filled the tub and tickled their legs. They all sat on the edge, Savannah in the middle. The smell of eucalyptus laced the air. The sight warmed Ben's heart, and he had to place his hand over it. Avery shut off the water and turned to lock eyes with him. He mouthed a silent thank you. She put her hand over his on his chest, making his heart do funny things, and pushed him out of the doorway. Speaking quietly, she filled him in. These two have been best friends for a while, but I had an idea that they might be open to a third best friend. I hope it works out. She lifted on her toes, as if her hope was strong enough to carry her away. Ben captured her hand in his. Me too. He stared into her eyes, falling further and further. His gaze dropped to her lips, and before he could stop himself or think better of it, he kissed her. It was quick and warm and over so fast he couldn't believe he had the guts to go for it. Her hand flew to her lips. Suddenly, the weight of the kiss pressed upon him. He'd been her only first date. Which meant that he just kissed a woman who had only ever kissed one man and he'd done it without thinking about her. He'd just taken what he wanted. I'm sorry. She stepped back, her eyes full of questions. He had no idea how to put a voice to all the thoughts jumbling together in his head. He wasn't sorry he'd kissed her. But it was too late to say that. What can I do for the ladies' night? He needed to do something or he'd go mad. 
Um. She rubbed her lips together. Were they tingling like his? The longer he stood there, the more aware he became of how high he'd been during that moment and how low he dropped after. Order a cookie tray. They'll love it. He rushed to the phone on the nightstand. She could have asked him to have the entire kitchen delivered, and he'd do it for her. The water's getting cold, called Margot. Avery shook herself and headed back in. That means it's time to rinse and get ready for face masks. There were giggles all around. Ben ordered a deluxe cookie and brownie bar to be delivered post-haste. When he hung up the phone, he peeked in on the girls. They were busy painting one another's faces with blue, green, and pink clay. All three of them had all three colors in different places. Avery turned from the mirror, her face covered in green. She smiled. Girls, Ben needs a turn. They rushed him, their goopy hands grabbing at his arms. He held up his hands. Oh no. I'm fine. I'm fine. He glanced at Savannah to find her pleading with him to play along. Being a father apparently meant being willing to humiliate yourself. Come on, Dad. This one says it fights aging. She held up the green packet. Hey. I'm not aging. Well, you're not getting any younger, quipped Margot. Ben scowled at her while Avery giggled. Come on. Let them practice on you. He heaved a put upon breath. Fine. He dropped the toilet seat lid and sat down so he was at a level the girls could reach. Get him wet first. Sophie brought a dripping washcloth to his face. She moistened his forehead and cheeks until his shirt was soaked. I should have put on a robe, he muttered for only Avery to hear. She smothered her laughter and took the washcloth from Sophie. I'll rinse this out. You help with the mask. He closed his eyes tight and tucked his lips in, afraid to talk lest he eat dirt. That was what they were smearing over his face and neck. He could smell the earthy tones along with something that made his skin tingle. Shoot, he hoped he wasn't allergic to the ingredients. Is it supposed to tingle? He got out between frozen lips. Yep, Savannah quipped. There was a note of joy in her voice that he hadn't heard since the move. Things were going well. And he owed it all to Avery. A quick rap sounded at the door. Room service, the porter called. I'll get it. Ben got to his feet, making the girls back up. They exchanged a worried look. Your face. Margot pointed at him. He stuck out one hip and planted his hand into it. I'm fabulous, just the way I am. He lifted his nose and sauntered out of the bathroom. The giggles that followed him made the look the porter gave him totally worth it. If you had a daughter, you'd understand, he tried to explain. I do, sir. And I won't say a word. Thank you. Ben glanced at the golden name tag. Henry. Henry made short work of setting up the rolling tray and removing the dish coverings. I'll be back to pick this up. I'll put in the hall when we're done. Ben fished a 50 out of his pajama pocket and handed it over with a firm handshake. Very good, sir. The girls trickled out of the bathroom, their faces freshly washed. I smell sprinkles, said Sophie. Ben laughed. How do you smell sprinkles? I have a gift. He laughed harder. Come check this out. I think you get to frost your cookie or brownie, Anne. There are sprinkles. Yes. Sophie bounced over, the other two following. He stepped back to give them full access. They seemed to be getting along famously. He scratched his face and came away with fingernails full of dust. Shoot. Avery was still in the bathroom. He stuck his head in and watched as she removed the last of the blue goo. Any chance you could help me out? He pointed to his face. Sure. 
She motioned him in even as she grabbed a new washcloth off the stack and put it under running water. He sat once again. I'm guessing they don't make you sit on a toilet in a spa. She chuckled, wringing out the washcloth. No. Thankfully, the girls didn't notice the lack of luxuries. She stepped forward, hesitating before laying the cloth over his whole face. Let that sit there for a minute. Her voice had gone softer. The sound of girls giggling and making a complete mess trickled into the bathroom, letting him know they were as alone as they were going to get. I'm sorry I said I was sorry. So you're not sorry? Not for kissing you. He pulled the cloth off his face. I'm sorry I didn't ask your permission. She took the washcloth from his hand and moved to stand close to him, her leg leaning into his. I'm glad you didn't, she said quietly, her voice intimate. You are? She began wiping his face in long, soft strokes, folding the washcloth after each pass. I've always thought that it kind of killed the mood for a guy to ask if he could kiss you. Yeah, but if the answer is no, then I'm getting smacked. She paused. One hand was on the side of his face, and the other slid behind his neck and into his hair. He sparked everywhere her fingers touched. Then it's a good thing I didn't say no. She leaned closer, her minty breath brushing his lips. Instead of closing the distance and satiating the growing need he felt for her, she asked, Excuse me? Can I kiss you? In a deep voice. Surprised, he snorted a laugh. She pulled back, grinning in victory. Okay. I see your point. She went back to cleaning him off. He could only imagine how manly he must look at the moment. Her hip brushed his arm, making him hyper-aware of her womanly curves. She smelled clean with a hint of vanilla, and he wondered if he buried his face in her neck if all he would smell was the vanilla. I think it was your delivery, he blurted. She cocked her hip. Excuse me? You got problems with my delivery? He nodded, taking her hand, and brushed her knuckles with his thumb. He stood, ready to show her how it was done, when the doorway filled with little girls. We can't get the movie to work. Ben jumped away from Avery, feeling three sets of allies on him. His ears burned like the fires of Hades. Avery busied herself at the sink, rinsing out washcloths. She kept her back to the girls, letting him deal with the situation. I'll come look at it. He beat the girls to the remote control on the bottom of the bed. There were cookie crumbs all over the comforter. He'd have to sleep in Savannah's room and let her have the master tonight, because there was no way he was rolling in sugar. He was going to have a hard enough time sleeping after what almost happened with Avery. He'd had all the right moves mapped out, and the moment was snatched from him like an interception on the one-yard line. His heart rate would not slow down. I think the mask worked. You look younger, Mr. Wileby, Margo stated. I do. He turned to Savannah for confirmation. She narrowed her eyes. Nah. He just looks happy. And the movie's starting. He tossed the remote on the bed. The less they noticed about him right now, the better. Avery leaned against the wall, a knowing smile on her lips. Mrs. Croft, come watch with us, called Sophie. Avery held up two bottles of nail polish in red and hot pink. I'll paint your nails while we watch. Yes. Savannah wiggled in happiness. Ben took up residence in a leather chair in the corner. He declined the girl's offer to paint his toenails and retrieved his laptop. Quinn would be happy if he answered a few emails. As he worked, his eyes strayed to Avery and the girls on the bed. Avery had laid a towel over the bottom of the bed, and the girls lined their toes up so she could paint alternating colors across all thirty nails. They wiggled and laughed and talked about their teachers and what school uniforms should really look like. Apparently, plaid was out. Avery was one of the girls, in her element, where he was a fish out of water. That was something to consider much slower and with much more attention. He needed to know if he was ready to make room in his life for someone new. 
Not someone, Avery. She'd grabbed his interest and surprised him over and over again in the best ways. Bringing these girls over had been an answer to his prayer. Now he and Savannah wouldn't dread the new school week. Before he went and lost his head, and his heart, for this woman, he had to think this through, he couldn't just jump. Because Savannah would fall in love with Avery too, and then her heart would be on the line. She was much too young to be handed the kind of pain that came when someone you loved walked away, especially from her father. He refused. What they needed was more time together. He dove back into his laptop, intent on creating the perfect opportunity for them to connect. There was one place he could take Avery and Landon, but he'd have to get Savannah's permission first. This was their special place, and they didn't share it outside of their family circle. The fact that he wanted to take Avery there showed that she meant more to him than he dared admit. Chapter 15 Avery stepped carefully off the luxury cruise bus. Her legs were sore in places that should never be sore. She ran several miles almost every day, and yet a hike made her walk like an 80-year-old woman. She'd be fine after a nice long soak in the tub with one of the leftover packets of Epsom salts from the ladies' night. The girls were so cute. She'd never let herself think about what it would be like to have a daughter, but now she knew she was missing out. Oh sure, the hormones would kick in any minute and there would be drama spilt like blood on a battlefield, but she'd take it. She'd take all of it in a heartbeat. Which scared the heck out of her. She could so easily see herself stepping in as Savannah's mother figure. She had to continually remind herself that Savannah had a mom. It wasn't her place. But the girl made it so easy, turning to her in those moments when she needed a boost of confidence or pointing to her smile to show Avery she was practicing her friend-making technique. It was all too easy. And then there was Ben. Glorious, gorgeous, kiss-stealing Ben. He was like icing on the cake. Thick, chocolatey frosting. The kind you want to scoop off with your finger and lick away. If someone had told her she'd drool over the guy who showed up 21 minutes late to their first date, she'd laugh in their face. And yet, she could hardly keep her eyes to herself as Ben and Savannah walked down the bus steps. He caught her looking, and she blushed, turning away. Porters unloaded the luggage from the compartments under the buses. Drivers snagged the pieces that belonged to their employers and loaded them into the trucks of waiting cars. The whole process worked like a ballet with each performer doing their part. Some of the drivers even wore uniforms. The children had gathered samples from nature for their science class. Instead of memorizing pictures of the plants, they'd brought them home, pressed between wax paper. The journals were leather-bound works of art. Avery planned to display Landon's on the coffee table in the front room, where she could see it every day and remember this extraordinary adventure. It would also be a talisman of awesome mom, reminding her to cage mother bear every once in a while. Followed closely by all those memories would be the memories of Ben. His hands were large and they'd tickled her arm with their touch, electrifying her entire body in the process. The students and chaperones mingled, saying goodbyes. Since it was a four-day weekend, they had Monday to recuperate before they had to go back to school. Her job was the best. She didn't have to rush off to work Monday morning. She arched her back to stretch out the muscles. Ben sidled up to her, the heat from his skin searing into her body and making her feel melty and delicious. She almost welcomed the time away from him. Surely, distance would allow her to meticulously dissect the weekend and figure out exactly how he managed to make her stomach do flip-flops with his crooked smile. What do you guys have planned for tomorrow? Avery did her best to appear unaffected by his proximity. She flipped her hair off her forehead. The laundry is calling my name. Landon rolled his eyes. Ben ran his hand through his hair and shifted his weight. We were, uh, wondering if you wanted to go on an outing with us tomorrow. Savannah smiled up at Avery with that look, the one that had so much hope twisted up with a need for acceptance. Goodness, if the yummy man wasn't enough to tempt her, that look would pull her right in. Avery rubbed her lips together, hesitating. 
She'd already blown her food budget on feeding half the fifth-grade boys junk food over the weekend. Not to mention there was the whole getting away from him so she could return to normal benefit she'd looked forward to. Our treat, Ben added. Avery's neck warmed. That's all she needed, was to be Ben's charity case. Mom, Landon practically barked at her when she didn't answer right away. Can we go? Avery gave him her best mom stare. The one that said if he used that tone with her again, he'd be scrubbing out the recycle bins with a toothbrush. Even as she leveled him with the stink eye, she was trying to come up with the last time she'd taken him out on the town. It had been over winter break. Let's do it. Ben's posture relaxed, and she realized he'd been nervous to ask them, which made her all the more curious about where they were going. Savannah and Landon fist bumped. The parking lot was almost empty, and Ben's driver stood by the back door of a limo, waiting patiently. Avery's used Toyota was parked in her designated spot. Water spots dotted the paint, indicating that it had rained while they were away. Ben stepped backward. We'll text you the info. You don't have my number. I'll use Capture My Heart. She nodded. I forgot I had it on my phone. One side of Ben's mouth lifted in a rough and tumble grin. So you haven't been on any more blind dates? Are you kidding? I had to make her go on the first one. Landon hiked his backpack up higher on his shoulder. She never goes out. Way to make me look like a loser. I go out. Nothing made a guy more interested than knowing you were available every night of the week, not. Not with guys. Landon looked at her like she was crazy. Okay, this is a conversation for never. She looped her arm around Landon's shoulder and steered him towards her car. On the way, they snagged the handles for their suitcases and rolled them across the blacktop. They waved as the limo pulled away. Can they even see us? asked Landon. PFT. Who knows? Avery shut the trunk and slid into the driver's seat. Are you really cool hanging out with them? Landon had a large group of guy friends, but he never talked to or about girls. The guys will totally choke when they hear I'm chillin' with a sixth grade girl. The way he said it made it sound like a conquest. Avery's hackles rose. Landon noticed. It's a prank, Mom. What? I'm pranking you. She relaxed her grip on the wheel. So, yeah, I'm cool with it. Savannah's not bad. And I like Ben. He throws a good spiral and didn't get upset when Devin farted really loud. Wow. He's a regular prince. Ben had earned a lot of points over the weekend. We'll see how it goes tomorrow, she said quietly. Being on the field trip was like being in a dream world. Someone else vacuumed, made the beds, and aired out the room so she couldn't smell Landon's socks. But they were back to reality, and things like schedules and school got in the way. She wasn't sure who Ben was when real life played a part. She just knew she was looking forward to finding out. Chapter 16 Is this for real? Avery swallowed heavily as she eased to a stop at the security hut, unable to answer Landon's question. Hut may not be the right word. The heavy iron gates with the cove crest in the center barred the entrance. To keep out the riffraff, like me. She fervently wished she'd taken the extra five minutes to go through a car wash before following her phone's navigation to the address Ben had texted her the night before. She gave her ID to the uniformed guard, who was taller than the pine trees in the hundred-acre wood. You're going to go up the hill. On the left will be a castle. Mr. Wileby's drive is to the right, but you can't see the house from the road. The man handed back her ID without a smile. He had the kind of face that had been carved out of stone, but the carver didn't worry too much about smoothing things out. Thanks. She swallowed, hoping she didn't go the wrong way and run into this guy's angry face. Landon stared out the window, his mouth hanging open as the car climbed the hill. The castle came into view, hard to miss as the turrets towered over them. 
Placed on the highest area of the cove, it looked like something out of a fairy tale. These guys are richy rich. Avery cringed as she made the turn into the private drive lined with huge maple trees. They're just people, dude. People who live in exclusive neighborhoods and have a stinking carousel in their front yard. She tapped on the brakes, and they sat there and stared at the brightly colored horses, and, was that a dragon? Behind them, a security car passed the driveway, moving slow enough that she could easily make out the crest on the door. Had they been back there the whole time as she gaped? She'd been so busy staring at the castle, and now the carousel, that she hadn't noticed. The carousel was circled by a five-foot cobblestone walkway. Around that was ten to fifteen feet of grass and then flower beds alive with color. Maple trees were planted at even intervals, their branches touching far above the red flag at the top of the center pole, giving the area a sense of being apart from the rest of the world. She could imagine that when the music played and the lights were on, magic came to life. The house was made up of right angles and boxes of varying sizes, like something a child would build after a big delivery from Amazon. Except that it was finished in stone, copper, and brick and looked nothing like cardboard. The main house, probably the living area for the family, was directly behind the carousel. The front doors were large enough to drive a car through. There was a tunnel made up of arches and glass that connected the family house to a smaller, though no less impressive second mansion on the left. Avery snapped her lips together to make sure her mouth wasn't hanging open. She could just hear her mother quote Mary Poppins, we are not a codfish, as she stared in open wonder. To the right of the main house was another complete house, the smallest of the three. While they weren't similar enough to be copies of the same floor plan, they were certainly close enough to be considered sisters. She could fit her condo in the front entryway of the main house. I'd hate living here. Why? Landon rounded on her like she'd just kicked his puppy. Think of the toilets they have to clean. Mom, be real. They aren't cleaning any toilets. She giggled. Probably not. Oh my gosh. Can you believe this place? I thought Brendan had an awesome house. He does. This house ate his house for breakfast. Plus, they have a carousel in their front yard. We have to pay five bucks to ride the one at the pier. Her smile was weak at best. We'd better find Ben and Savannah. Landon nodded, his eyes fixated on the shiny black stallion. When he was five, that same look meant he was going to bolt for it. The sound of rubber tires on the brick driveway, probably handlaid, had them turning in unison to see Ben driving a shiny black golf cart their way, Savannah riding in the passenger seat. Her hair was in pigtails, and she wore a bright-colored shirt and jean shorts. Ben was in khaki shorts and a polo shirt that lay nicely across his firm shoulders. Avery licked her lips and then scolded herself. Ben was not a tasty treat, though he did look delectable. Landon let out a low whistle. Nice wheels. Ben chuckled. Thanks. It was owned by Elvis Presley. He patted the steering wheel. Who? asked Landon. Avery about choked on her tongue. Elvis. He sings Jailhouse Rock. That old song you dance to when you're baking brownies? He gave her the same horrified look he did when she shook her booty and shimmied around the kitchen. It's so embarrassing, he told Savannah. Can we ride that? He pointed to the black horse. He may have exercised some self-control, but his fixation on the carousel was just as strong as it had been when he was five and wanted to ride. Another time. Ben exchanged a conspiratorial look with Savannah. I think you'll like what we have planned today. Avery liked the idea that Ben was already planning another time to have them over. Riding with the kids would be fun, but a chance for the two of them to take a pair of wooden horses would be romantic. They're vintage, aren't they? For some reason, the animals appeared to be carved out of wood and not made from fiberglass. She could tell they were of higher quality than the ones she'd ridden lately. She and Landon climbed into the back seat. 
There were no seat belts, so they held onto the armrests as Ben shot off down the driveway. I bought it at auction in New York and had it restored while the house was being built. He spoke over his shoulder with his eyes on the road. It was part of the 1939 World's Fair and had been put into storage for over 70 years before the city decided to pull it out and make some money off of it. Of course they did. Of course you did. Ben spoke as if buying an antique carousel happened on a regular Tuesday afternoon. It probably did. She could see him picking up an Elvis golf cart on Monday and a carousel on Tuesday and Bigfoot on Wednesday. Avery shifted in her seat, crossing and recrossing her legs. The Elvis mobile was more comfortable than her mattress, and yet she couldn't find a position that suited her. Passing through the metal gates into the cove was like falling down a rabbit hole. They drove into a small airport. Planes were parked outside of hangars, several metal buildings with names and crests over the large rolling doors that hid other planes from their prying eyes. And yeah, her eyes were prying. A man in a leather flight jacket and aviator glasses waved. He was taking a close look at all parts of the plane and she didn't want to interrupt him so she gave a small finger wave. Ben pulled up to a building that had a carousel over the entrance. He and Savannah climbed out, followed quickly by Landon, who had no desire to hang out with his mother when he had the opportunity to explore the red airplane that was apparently waiting for them. He came over and shook Ben's hand. Thanks for flying us out, Lincoln. Thank you. I've been dying to get into this baby and see what she can do. Lincoln rubbed his hands together in glee. Ben laughed. Go easy on us. We've got a couple first-timers aboard. Lincoln winked her way. I can't make any promises, except that you'll get where you want to go on time. Avery smiled. Lincoln was a jokester, but she'd seen the way he looked at the plane. He took flying seriously. He went back to his pre-flight checkoff. Are you coming? Ben held out his hand to help her off the golf cart. She looked from him to the plane. Landon had already disappeared inside. When you said outing, I thought you were talking about visiting the aquarium or going for clam chowder on the pier, not, she waved her hand toward the plane. Mom. Landon popped out of the open plane door and waved his arms over his head to get her attention. He didn't have to try so hard. Her ears were genetically altered at his birth to seek out his voice in any situation. Savannah says we're going to Magic Lamp Park. Avery sank deeper into the seat. Seriously? Seriously. Ben smiled, obviously pleased with Landon's reaction and missing the weight he'd dumped on her shoulders. I can't. I mean, I'm not at all prepared for an amusement park. She brought her hand to her cheek and patted it to see if she could feel the contact. She could. This was for Rayals. Ben leaned over and inspected her footwear. His text had told them to wear shoes they could walk in, which had only made her suspicion on the local aquarium seem all the more likely. What do you need? he asked, his brow lined. Her mind raced. A cooler with food. Water bottles. Sunscreen. She trailed off. She most certainly did not vacation like a billionaire. Then again, she wasn't one. Ben waved off her concern. Food and drinks are taken care of, and they have sunscreen at the gift shop. He took her hand and pulled her out of the seat. Come on, the kids won't wait forever. A shock went up her arm at the contact, and she gripped his hand to keep from bouncing off of him. He squeezed her fingers in return. His eyes crinkled in that attractive way men had of wearing wrinkles like badges of honor. It was so hot on Hugh Jackman, but Ben put him to shame, his brown eyes danced as he pushed her ahead of him up the stairs. Ben was the biggest kid of them all, she truly was falling down the rabbit hole today. She thought about taking a selfie on the plane, but no one would believe her if she posted it. This wasn't her world. She'd been invited as a guest, but there was no way a man like Ben, who owned a cherry red airplane, could stay interested in her for long. She was shiny today, and tomorrow she'd be forgotten. 
The thought made her sad, and she had to turn her face to the window to hide her emotions from the excited bunch discussing which ride they would go on first. Ben might just be playing, but her feelings were mixed up in all of this craziness. She liked him. Liked him more than she'd thought possible. He was kind, generous, and he treated Landon like he, well, like he mattered. If she wasn't careful, she could even love Ben. Chapter 17 Ben handed out the lanyards. If you lose it, let me know and we'll have them bring us a new one. Avery adjusted the lanyard so the ticket enclosed in plastic lay flat against her stomach. She'd been awfully quiet on the flight, and even more so when the town car picked them up and dropped them at the gate, where a small army waited with their tickets and daily packs. They each had a drawstring backpack with the park logo. Inside were bottles of water, snacks, and a souvenir magic lamp. Savannah led the way through the main entrance gate with the gold lettering and the mystical carpet draped over the top bar. The attendants waved at her, recognizing the lanyards that singled them out as VIP guests. She'd been to the park enough times to be a wonderful guide. Where are we going? asked Avery. The flying carpet, Savannah answered. They discussed the rides and possibilities on the flight, but Avery had stared out the window for most of it. She was in some kind of shock or regretted agreeing to come. Her profile said she liked roller coasters. He prayed that was true, otherwise this whole day was going to be a disaster. Avery squinted up at the sign where a digital clock flashed the current wait time. It's 45 minutes. Maybe we should ride something else while the line dies down. We don't have to wait. Savannah showed her ticket to the attendant standing at the entrance, and he motioned for them to go through the exit. Landon followed. Avery grabbed Ben's arm as they wound through the shaded tunnel. I don't understand. What's happening? These are all access passes. We can get right on any ride, go to the front of the food lines, have front row seats at the shows and parades. How did you? He dropped his eyes before lifting them to meet hers and offering a sheepish grin. I know a guy who owns half the park. She stared at him, not blinking. It's you, isn't it? He gave her a stupid half-smile for an answer. The color drained from her face, and she pressed her hand against the wall as if she needed it to hold her up. Ben waved the kids ahead. We'll wait here for you too. Are you okay? Landon asked Avery. Ben warmed at the worry Landon displayed for his mom. Fine. I just need a minute to sit. The plane. She sat on the decorative rocks and leaned her head back against the wall. Ben waved them on. We'll wait here. The kids nodded and then took off running. I thought I was doing okay, Avery mumbled. Ben sat next to her and took her hand. Her fingers were cold. He rubbed them between his palms to warm them up. You're doing great, he said, though he had no idea what she was talking about. She snatched her hand away. I'll never be able to compete with this. Gah. Ben, no wonder my kid is embarrassed to say hi to me in the hall. She buried her face in her hands. I was completely delusional to think I could get away with enrolling him in that school if I bought the right pants and kept his hair cut. Ben rubbed his gut. He'd just been punched there by her words, and the feeling wasn't pleasant. Still, it wasn't about him. He'd wanted to bring Avery and Landon here because he wanted to share this park with them. Today was supposed to make her smile. Avery. He rubbed her back. Your income has nothing to do with Landon not wanting to talk to you. She hummed, giving him a thanks-a-lot glare. I think it's because you dress like an eight-year-old. Her hands dropped and she stared at him, aghast. He laughed. I'm joking. You're beautiful. He brushed the hair away from her face and kissed her head. Then he felt dumb for taking such liberties. It was natural, though, and he couldn't take it back, so he decided to roll with it. She elbowed him in the stomach. Her lips twitched. 
Landon is on his way to being one of the best men on the planet because of you. It's not money that makes the man, it's the mother. She leaned into his side. Ben, we can't accept this. She took the pass off her neck and tried to hand it to him. Ben didn't reach for it. He considered his words carefully, not wanting to lay his feelings out there to be stomped on, but desperate to explain. This is mine and Savannah's special park. Quinn and I built it the year I gained full custody of her. We spent hours here, walking through attractions, evaluating designs. It was amazing, seeing it through her eyes. Every time we checked something off the list, Savannah and I grew closer together. We spent so much time talking about the future of this place, the construction process, that it lessened the destruction her mother and I put into her life. That's sweet. He tightened his hold on her hands and pulled them to his chest, where his heart beat a quick staccato. It's our special place, and when I told her I wanted to bring you two here, she agreed right away. In a way, you wearing that lanyard is symbolic of bringing you and Landon into our inner circle. So. She pulled her mouth down in an I've messed up expression. It's a huge insult not to accept? The biggest. Like spitting in my face. She burst out laughing. Well, we can't have that, now, can we? He brushed his knuckles over her cheek. You're quite beautiful. A blush filled her cheeks with the most amazing color. That was awesome. Landon ran pell-mell down the exit route. Savannah was laughing and keeping right with him. She was taller than Landon by about four inches, but that wouldn't last long. He'd hit a growth spurt in the next three years, and she'd be looking up to him. The vision of it was as real as the tropical flowers growing behind them. What's next? Ben asked. The scrambler, the kids cheered. They looked at Avery, a matching crease of worry between their brows. Avery settled her pass around her neck once again. To the scrambler. She thrust her fist in the air, earning more cheers. Her eyes caught Ben's, and her smile was just for him. It warmed him all the way through, filling his chest with a desire to be her last first date. Chapter 18 Avery relaxed into the camel-colored leather seat in the plane while Landon slept with his head in her lap. He'd curled up against her a few moments before, allowing her to play with his hair like she had when he was a toddler and couldn't sleep. Ben and Savannah sat across from them, making a beautiful scene. She wished her phone was handy so she could get a picture. Ben was. Sigh. Amazing. He'd spoiled them with churros, a roasted chicken dinner at the nicest restaurant in the park, and his undivided attention. Once she'd stopped thinking about how much everything cost, she'd been able to join in the fun. The rabbit hole wasn't so strange anymore. In fact, she wouldn't be surprised if they had an unbirthday party in the hangar when they got back. Savannah leaned against her dad, her eyes heavy. The overhead lights were dimmed and their windows were dark. Did you have fun? Ben asked her in hushed tones. The lights had been dimmed to a soft golden glow and the temperature was comfortable. Savannah yawned and nodded. It was Avery she spoke to. It was way more fun with you guys here. You're coming again next time, aren't you? Avery's eyes skimmed over to Ben to see his reaction to the invitation. Magic Lamp was their special place, and she'd been honored to be invited along on their family time, but she wasn't about to assume that they would be going back. Ben locked gazes with her. I'd like it if you would. She settled there, comfortable with his attention. He'd said that she and Landon were part of his inner circle today, but the longing in his eyes said he wanted her to stay. We can probably make that happen. Savannah smiled until she too fell asleep. Avery stared down at her boy, going over the day in her mind. They'd had fun, together. Like playmates and the buddies they used to be. Her body was sore. The aches from the hike were still there, though less intense. Added to that were sore back muscles from carrying the drawstring backpack. The pains were all a blessing she'd take on again in a heartbeat. 
What are you thinking? Ben asked quietly. His voice was deep and low so as not to wake the kids. Chills rushed over her skin at the rumble of it, and her heart thrummed. I was just thinking that today reminded me that I can be fun. She lifted her gaze to meet his. She had to be careful, because when their eyes met, it felt like Ben could see right to the depths of her soul. She'd never be able to hide something from him. I feel positively spoiled. She cupped Landon's head, indicating that the best part of the day was right now. Thank you. This is more than I deserve. You deserve a whole lot more than this, Avery. I'm not sure. Holding my kid? It's pretty much heaven. He lifted a hand, reaching for her. She reached back, but neither of them could bear to drop their child to get closer. He chuckled, and she giggled. They relaxed back in their seats, content to bask in the moment. What's the hardest thing about being a billionaire? she asked in order to lighten the mood. No sense tormenting the both of them with a kiss that couldn't happen right now. Later, she promised herself. Ben didn't even have to think about the answer. This week? Ordering pizza. What? No way. He nodded. I tried. It was a disaster. I don't believe you. She smiled, happier than she'd been in a long time. The phone order went through just fine. But the delivery guy had a record, and they wouldn't let him through the gate. Wait, how did they know he had a record? He pressed his lips together and lifted both eyebrows. Maybe I don't want to know. He chuckled. Probably not. Avery wanted to sit next to him, to feel his laughter rumble in his chest. I shudder to know what you learned about me the moment I went through the gate. He shook his head. You got through, so I know you haven't robbed a bank or anything. Well, it's nice to know my spotless reputation paid off. She shifted slightly. So what happened? He cringed. Security confiscated him and the pizza. They ran all sorts of tests on it, which made it inedible. By the time I was called to confirm that I actually had ordered the pizza, the poor guy had confessed everything he'd ever done to the interrogation specialist and the authorities had to be called in. Interrogation specialist? You live in a crazy world, Ben Wileby. I know. He patted Savannah's knee as if making sure she was still there. So ordering pizza is harder than being a single parent? Heck no. But you asked about being a billionaire. Being a parent is a completely different role. I worry every day that I'm giving her too much, that I'm not giving her enough. Am I being too tough, expecting too much? Or am I not expecting enough? And then there's the guilt that pops up because of the divorce. He paused, his thumb tapping on the armrest. I see the way she looks at you, Avery. You're an angel in her eyes, can do no wrong and she craves your attention. Avery nodded. It melts my heart. It breaks mine. Why? If I'd chosen a better woman to be her mother, then she wouldn't have a hole inside her. Avery bit her lip. We can't help who we love. No, but we can choose to act on that love. You didn't have Savannah to consider when you married, she cut off, not even knowing the woman's name. Still, he turned to the window. I have her now. You're a lucky man, Ben. Not because you're a billionaire, but because you're rich in other ways. He turned back to her. I'd like to kiss you right now. I'd love it if you would. She grinned, knowing they were both trapped. But he carefully got up, laying Savannah on her side and tucking a blanket around her. The whole time he moved, Avery's heart hammered against her ribs, screaming, He's going to kiss me. He's going to kiss me. She could barely breathe by the time he slipped his hand under Landon's head and she slipped out from under him. Ben placed a pillow where she'd sat and rested Landon's head on it. The boy let out a contented sigh. Avery twisted her fingers. 
Realizing what she was doing, she dropped her hands to her side and squared her shoulders. Ben ran his hand down her arm and hooked her pinky. She gasped as memories of Luke filled her head. It wasn't like the memories were bad, it was the feeling of Luke telling her it was okay to be with Ben, that he approved. Ben led her to the back of the plane, where there was a leather-lined booth. He leaned against it and pulled her to him, holding her close. For one minute, can we forget that we're grown-ups? He brushed his fingers down the side of her face. Did he want to be able to let go of the pressures they both faced and be together, just the two of them? Because that sounded wonderful to her. Or was he asking for a non-committal kiss? She'd gladly give him either, but she needed to know what she was agreeing to. Before she could answer, he pressed his lips to hers, and everything she'd been worried about, all the tiny stresses that come from being a mom, like how she were going to get home, get Landon into bed, and have things ready for work the next day, faded away like the last rays of sunshine over the horizon. Ben's arms, all muscles and power, wrapped her up, and she was lost. Lost, because she didn't know who she was at the moment or what she was doing. Who was this woman kissing a man in a private plane? Was she the type of woman who allowed herself to be carried away by passion? Her doubt had her pulling back, slowing things down, and trying to catch her breath. Ben pulled her in tighter, making the butterflies explode in happy little pops. Yes, yes, she was the type of person to make out with a hot guy. She was a woman who went after the man she wanted. She threaded her fingers into his hair and moaned softly, giving herself over to the experience and relishing the knowledge that she was powerful and strong and sexy enough that she made him growl and deepen the kiss. She may not have known this side of her when she was with Luke, but that didn't mean it was any less real. Forgetting that she was a mom, that she had to set an example, she locked her arms behind Ben's head and kissed him for all she was worth. Chapter 19 Ben waited in the car outside the school. He checked his Apple Watch for the twentieth time. Avery's lunch hour started at 1.15. It was 1.16. He bounced his leg, nervous for their first real date. They'd spent so much time together with the kids lately that they were beginning to feel like a family. Savannah and Landon got along better than siblings. They lacked any type of rivalry and were good friends. Savannah had also gone to Margot's house after school one afternoon to hang out. His daughter didn't play with friends anymore. She was too old for that. Avery quick-stepped her way out of the building, wearing a cinched raincoat over a knee-length dress and heels. He loved it when she wore heels. He loved it when she was barefoot, too. She had the most perfect feet he'd ever seen. Gibbs opened the door for her, and she slid into the car. Ben wrapped his arm around her and pulled her right up next to him. Hey. Hey, yourself. She giggled. He should feel old with a daughter growing up so fast, but being with Avery made him feel young and invincible again. He gave her a quick kiss hello before Gibbs made it back behind the wheel. Ben would love to explore the growing feelings in his heart for this woman in the back seat of the limo. However, this was an official date. He'd asked her out. He'd sent flowers this morning. They'd managed to find time without the kids. It felt like there was so much writing on this. He knew he liked Avery as a mom, heck, he could even say he loved her as a mother for his daughter. One day those kids would be gone, and they'd need to get along after that too. He'd already been through one divorce, and he didn't have any plans for another one. How's work? The car moved forward. They'd be at their destination soon. He'd chosen a restaurant close to the school so they'd have as much time as possible to linger. She sighed and leaned into him. The sensation of being her rock was one of his favorites. It's work. We're gearing up for graduation, and it's always such a big production. Plus, we have at least one senior who is in danger of not graduating, and her parents are livid. At her or you. At everyone. They say we failed her. We say she's lazy. It's a big mess. I'm sorry you have to deal with that. 
she forced a smile and sat taller. I don't have to deal with it for at least an hour. So what do you want to talk about? They'd agreed that they wouldn't discuss the kids. He was kind of at a loss for conversation topics. Tell me about growing up. He rubbed his free hand down the front of his jeans. It's just me and my brother. Quinn? Yep. We're still pretty tight. He loves designing coasters. I think he does it in his sleep, because he'll be totally out, snoring away, and then jump up and hit the computer with this new idea. She smiled. Sounds like he's found his passion. Yeah. And he's so good. Ah. You're proud of your little bro. She bumped him with her shoulder. He laughed and nodded. He made this crazy deal with a girl from college. If they aren't married by their ten-year reunion, they're supposed to marry each other. She blinked. Why didn't they just get married in college? That's not how marriage packs work. She laughed. I guess not. They pulled up in front of the purple papaya. I've got it, Gibbs. Very good, sir. Ben reached across Avery and pushed the door open. She twisted out of the seat, her knees together, and stood gracefully. The Duchess of Cambridge couldn't have done it better. He climbed out and offered her his arm. She linked hers to his, and he lifted his chest, prideful that this woman was his for the afternoon. They stepped inside the building. Avery gasped, her fingers digging into his arm. Ben followed her horrified gaze and found a small group of retirees staring at them with wide eyes. They had oversized purses, one with knitting needles sticking out the top. Another lady had a small dog in her purse, visible through the netting on the side. Avery's face turned seven shades of red. Hello, everyone. She released his arm quickly and stepped away from him. Ben frowned. The space between them was a forbidden zone, and he didn't like it one bit. What are you doing here, dear? asked a lady with dark gray hair and a scowl. Her tone was light, but the dark look she threw at Ben added with him to her question. She reached for Avery's shoulders and pulled her close, like a mother hen protecting her chick. I'm on a date. Avery reached blindly for Ben's arm, looking for all intents and purposes like a woman drowning. He stepped willingly to her side, ready to be whatever she needed at the moment. This is Ben Wileby. His daughter goes to the academy. Ben, this is Evelyn. How do you do? He nodded to her, afraid that if he offered his hand, she'd bite it. Better than I deserve. Evelyn's lips disappeared in a line of judgment as she scanned him from his shoes to his hair. Wonderful. He held his smile. Mr. Wileby, your table is ready, said the host. The astute man must have picked up on the tension from his place behind the podium and offered an escape. There was a hefty tip for him for saving them from this bizarre and uncomfortable situation. I'll see you later, dear, Evelyn promised, her voice steely. She lifted her purse higher on her shoulder. Ben shivered. Was that a threat? he whispered in Avery's ear. Avery's laugh was high and she cut it off too soon, glancing around them to see who had heard and stared. I'm sure it will be fine. She didn't sound fine at all, and her hands shook as she placed her napkin in her lap. Ben had the distinct feeling that there was a storm on the horizon. Whoever that woman was had an influence over Avery. How do you know her? Avery cringed. She's Landon's grandmother, my babysitter, and our next-door neighbor. Oh. A sense of unease tripped up his spine. He'd only seen his ex-mother-in-law once since the divorce, and that was disturbing at best. He couldn't imagine living next door to her, let alone bumping into her with a date. I'm sorry. That seemed. Difficult. Avery chewed her bottom lip. The movement was adorable, and he found himself staring at her mouth. It's my fault. I hadn't told her about. Us. Her lashes brushed her cheeks. Dating. 
Us dating. She paused. We're dating, right? He chuckled, taking her hand in his and rubbing circles with his thumb. Up to this point, I think we've been hanging out. But. He waited until her gorgeous green eyes lifted to meet his gaze so she'd see the honesty in what he was about to say. Today is our official first date. I'm already looking forward to a second. She blushed beautifully, a soft pink dancing across her cheeks. He was a goner for this woman. Me too. A server appeared with glasses of water. The mood lightened as he explained the specials. They ordered, and he was off again. Avery took a sip of her water and seemed to come to herself. Her shoulders relaxed and her hand steadied. Did you visit a lot of amusement parks as a kid? Ben smiled. He could talk about this all day long. Did we ever? She narrowed her eyes. Have you ever waited in line? He rubbed his chin in thought. Contemplated the answer. Chewed his lip. Anything he could think of to draw out the moment. No. She laughed, and whatever worries Evelyn had imposed upon them flew away like a seagull realizing there wasn't any food in the area. Whatever had happened with Avery and that woman was a blip in their otherwise wonderful lunch. They traded childhood memories as they worked their way through lemon chicken and herb salads. I'm sorry. Do you mind me talking about Luke? Is it weird? He rubbed his full stomach. It's not. Really? He sounds like the kind of guy I would want to be friends with. Ben had no jealousy inside of him for Avery's first husband. She spoke of him in the past tense. Even though there was love woven into her memories, and obviously her heart, it wasn't something he felt he needed to compete with. He was everybody's friend. The most popular guy in school. Without him, I would have been a wallflower. I highly doubt that. You're too opinionated. Hey. She laughed and winked at him. He captured her hand. I like us together. She smiled shyly. Me too. Her phone alarm rang in her purse. He checked his watch. It was time for them to leave if they were going to make it back to the school. Managing his time based on a work schedule was strange for him and took some adjustment. In his work life, if a lunch went long, his assistant adjusted the afternoon to accommodate him. You set an alarm for our date, he teased. The server had dropped off the leather book, and he'd already paid. They were free to go, so they gathered their raincoats. I didn't want to lose track of time. And for the record, I totally lost track of time. I can't believe it's been an hour. He held out her coat so she could slip her arms inside, taking advantage of the moment and pressing a kiss to her hair. Me neither. He checked off his mental list, noting that they were compatible without the kids around. We should do this again. She turned to face him, her hand landing on his chest, where his heart jumped and thumped because of her touch. Most definitely. You're not a bad date when you keep your food in your mouth. He pinched her side, earning a giggle. You're never going to let me live that one down, are you? She shook her head, barely keeping her laughter in. He motioned for her to precede him through the dining room, keeping his hand on her lower back. He loved the little arch there that felt like it was made just for him. The more time he spent with Avery, the more he believed they were made for one another. If things continued to progress, he proposed before school let out. There was no point in waiting, not when they would be much better together than they were apart. Chapter 20 All afternoon, Avery tried to hang on to the moments from lunch that made her feel safe and secure. Ben's hand covering hers at the table. His kiss to her hair. Even the way his hand fit perfectly in the small of her back made her feel like the world was turning at exactly the right speed. But she couldn't hold on to those feelings for long before worrying over what would happen when she got home and faced Evelyn. There was no putting it off, even if she did drag her feet at the grocery store. 
Landon had homework, and he was itching to get it done so he could watch the latest flash on the CW. He didn't even try to get around the homework first rule, he just wanted to blow through his math problems and settle in. For Avery, there would be no settling until the other shoe dropped. It dropped the minute they walked through the back gate. Evelyn sat on the round, pewter chair, her head bent over this month's book club selection, Cold Sassy Tree. Come on over and give your grams a hug. Evelyn held her arms out for Landon. He complied without dragging his feet. She hyped him up on homemade cookies, so it was still cool to hug her. How's school? Avery headed for the back door, hoping to get inside without having to have this awkward conversation in front of her son. Fine. But I have a lot of homework. Well, hustle on in there. I want to talk to your mom for a minute anyway. Curses. She ruffled Landon's hair and stared longingly at the door as he closed it behind him. Resigned, she took the other iron seat. She'd always hated this patio set but it came with the house when her parents sold it to her and Luke. She'd made Luke have tea parties here and it was part of their childhood, so Luke said they should keep it. She hadn't the heart to donate it after he passed away. How's your mom? Evelyn asked. Avery chewed the inside of her cheek. She's doing good. Winning at horseshoes. I miss her. She's a chatterbox. You can call. She'd love to hear from you. I talked to her a couple days ago. Evelyn scraped a piece of paint paint off the table. She didn't say anything about you dating again. You sure looked cozy with that guy. We've spent some time together. Dating wasn't a sin. She'd worked herself up into a tizzy gathering counterarguments and fighting the guilt that came from keeping secrets. Were you going to tell me? Avery closed her eyes and tapped her finger on the bridge of her nose. If things got serious. Evelyn leaned back in her chair. Honey, I've known you since the day you were born. I watched you and my Luke fall in love before either of you knew what love is. Avery gathered her purse into her chest, needing the comfort of holding tight. I like him. A slice of pain flashed over Evelyn's face. I loved Luke's dad like you loved Luke. I spent years looking for that kind of love again, and it just doesn't happen twice. Luke was, is, your soulmate. He's the one who will welcome you into heaven. He's watching over you and Ben every day. I know it. Avery rolled her thumb over a button on her coat over and over again. She couldn't argue with that kind of logic. No matter how happy you feel right now, you'll regret getting in deep with this guy. I was there with Robert. Remember? I remember, she whispered. Robert had lived down the street from them. He'd courted Evelyn all proper and sweet. Made her feel like opening her heart again. It wasn't a week after they were married that she found out about his online gambling addiction. He'd burned through the life insurance money and broken her heart in the process. She dried her tears and taken to this idea that there was one man made just for her, and he'd passed on. Avery had bought into the idea until she met Ben. He awakened feelings in her that Luke never had. Did that make them wrong? I don't know. It feels good to be with him. If you can tell me you haven't felt guilty once, haven't compared him to Luke, then I'll shut my trap and won't say another word. Avery clamped her lips shut. She had felt guilty on the plane just before giving herself over to the kiss. She had compared him to Luke on the hike. She'd even spent half of lunch telling Ben about how she and Luke used to collect spiders in jars and feed them flies. And then they'd misplaced a jar and found it under his bed, the lid asked you. That's what I thought. Evelyn stood, leaning on the table with both her hands. It's not fair to that man to lead him on. I'm not. I wasn't, she protested. She liked Ben, a lot. Maybe even loved him. He's got more money than some countries, so I know he's not after mine. It wasn't the money I missed. Avery's head jerked up. 
It wasn't? Evelyn sagged. When I took a good look at what Robert and I had, it was a shadow compared to my marriage. I'd settled for something because I was lonely. I liked feeling special. But I'm worth more than that. You're worth more than that. Avery nodded numbly. Evelyn patted her hand. I'm sorry, sweetie. I don't mean to rain on your parade or tell you not to be happy. I just don't want you to mistake a whirlwind romance for the real deal. Thanks, Ev. Avery looked at her chin, unable to meet her eyes. I think I'll sit out here for a bit and think things over. You sure? I can make you some herbal tea. No thanks. Evelyn made her way to her sliding glass door and disappeared inside, pulling the curtains shut to give Avery some privacy. She stayed in the courtyard, thinking over all the times she and Luke had played together, had snuck out in the middle of the night to hold hands, kiss, and even make out. Although making out was few and far between, knowing their parents were just inside. They hadn't needed loads of physical affection to know they loved one another. Even after they were married, their love life wasn't sparks. They loved as if they'd already been married for 15 years. In some ways, they were. It was a beautiful marriage that would have lasted the tests of time. They were going to make it to the end. Everyone said so. Luke knew it. She knew it. But then he was gone. She put her elbows on the table and rested her chin on her fists. What she felt for Ben was new and exciting, but it wasn't the lasting kind of love she'd experienced with Luke. Ben was all flash and style in his expensive suits and private planes. He was fun and funny. A good father. Stable. But he didn't know her like Luke had. Maybe Evelyn was right. Maybe that lasting love, the kind that allowed two people to communicate without words, didn't happen more than once in this life. Maybe she had a soul mate and would have to wait until heaven to see him again. Maybe God wanted her to spend her days on this earth alone. Maybe that was her mission in life, to rely on him and endure. And then there was Landon to consider. She'd spent years doing her best to get him through Belfast Academy, to provide an education that would ensure college and a good job. He didn't expect a big house or beg for things at the store. He took life as it came, if she continued to date Ben, if they, gulp, got married, Landon's life would change dramatically. What would a mansion and an Elvis golf cart do to her son? What would a breakup do to him? She folded over on herself. The deeper she got in with Ben, the further she pulled Landon into the pool. At what point was she exposing him to danger? She shuddered, knowing she was treading in deep waters already. She didn't know how long she stared at nothing, knowing that she needed to get out but not ready to lunge for safety just yet. She wanted to hold on to the feeling Evelyn had described, the feeling of being lovable, for as long as she could. When her phone rang, she blinked at the darkness that had descended upon the garden. Hello? Her voice was low, as low as she felt for even considering a life with Ben and Savannah without looking at all the variables. She jumped, and now that she was falling, she realized how stupid she had been. Hi, how was work? Ben asked. She brushed her fingers down her throat as if she could dislodge the lump that was stuck there. Fine. Good. There was an awkward pause where she would normally ask him how his day had gone. When she couldn't pull together the words, he filled in the emptiness. We have the carousel up and spinning tonight. Do you guys want to come over? Yes. She longed to step back into his magic world and forget the daily pressures of bills, laundry, and raising a son to face reality. I don't think we can make it. Landon buried in homework? I swear they have ten times more homework now than they did when we were kids. Uh, Ben? Yeah. Avery gripped her purse, still in her lap. I don't think I can do this. Talk about homework? Her lips lifted and then dropped just as fast. No. There was another heavy silence. 
This one wasn't awkward, just sad. Oh. You mean this. Yeah. I just. She owed him an explanation, and it's not you, it's me, though she'd never use those words. The trouble was, words were hard to come by right now. I thought I was ready to. That I was over. Moving on is. Avery, stop. I get it. Tears blurred her vision. You do? She half choked. I'm so sorry. There was another pause, this one like the suspended last note of a violin solo. Promise me something? She sniffed in reply. When you are ready, make sure the guy spoils you. You deserve to have someone in your life who will look for ways to make you smile. She pressed her hand over her mouth, tears burning twin trails down her cheeks. You're amazing, Ben. Good night, Avery. Night. She hung up the phone and buried her face in her arms. A few minutes later, or it could have been an hour, she wasn't keeping track of time, Landon called into the backyard. Mom? She hurriedly swiped her face and sniffed repeatedly. I'm coming. With a shuddering breath, she made herself stand up. She loved her son dearly, and leaning on that love was going to get her through this pain. As she got ready for bed, she wondered about the ache in her heart. If what she felt for Ben wasn't love, then why did losing him hurt so much? Chapter 21 Don't go up on your toes, warned Quinn. Ben glared at the golf ball. I haven't done that since Stanford. His golf coach had broken him of the nasty habit and shaped five swings off his game. You struggle to keep your feet on the ground in golf and in love. Ben pulled back and let his irritation at his brother fuel his swing. The ball soared a good 350 feet before bouncing twice and settling on the green. I don't know what you're talking about. Quinn scoffed, flipping his hair off his forehead with a jerk of his head. It had been a while since he'd been to the barber. He must be deep into his latest project. He got like that sometimes, only surfacing for food and golf. And the golf was only if Ben made an appointment. You're falling to pieces over this woman. I'm not. He handed his club to his caddy and waited for Quinn to take his shot. His ball landed just in front of the green. He'd be chipping on. You are. You haven't given me a hard time all day. It's like I'm here with the ghost of Ben past. The ghost of my past showed up out of the blue to take Savannah to lunch today. Ha! Quinn slapped him on the back. That's more like it. Let's have a go at Grace. Ben slumped into the passenger seat of the rented golf cart. No thanks. Okay, now I know something's up. Ben held onto the armrest as Quinn slammed his leather ECCO golf shoe down on the accelerator, making the cart lurch forward. Not all of us have a marriage pact to fall back on, Ben groused. Quinn smirked. Yeah, like that's going to work out. The clock is ticking, bro. Do you know where where she is? She'd been in Scotland for a while, last I checked. Which was years ago, by the way. She probably has a dozen bards and swaddles them in green and blue tartans, he said in his best Scottish accent. I think she moved to Africa after that. But let's get back to you. Ben hopped out of the cart before it came to a complete stop. Quinn was up first, so Ben hung back with the caddies, watching as Quinn chipped it onto the green, a foot away from the cup. Ben was up. There's not much to say. She wasn't emotionally available. So you're just going to step back? What choice do I have? He lined up his shot and sank the putt. Her husband died. Quinn stared at the hole. I don't know what to tell you. Exactly. Ben tucked the ball into his pocket and passed the putter to his caddy. He couldn't force Avery to be ready for love. He couldn't make her be a part of his family. It just sucks. You know? Anyway, I look at the situation, I'm unable to move. I can't go forward with a relationship without her on board. 
I can't go back to being just friends, not like we were ever just friends. We went from enemies' right to romantic interests. I'm hearing what you're saying, but I'm not hearing what's in your heart. Rarely did Quinn get this serious with him. They gave each other a hard time. They pushed one another to be brilliant in their respective fields. But when it came to feelings of the heart, they didn't share. So it surprised him that Quinn would even broach the subject. But what surprised him more was that he wanted to share his feelings. I love her. He lifted his shoulders, saying I'm hopeless, and I know it in one movement. I'm sorry. Me too. He was. Not only for himself, but for Savannah too. So far, he'd been able to put off her requests to spend more time with Avery and Landon, but he wouldn't be able to do that forever. As much as his heart ached for Avery, it also hurt for his daughter. Breakups truly sucked. Chapter 22 Avery stared at the computer screen, the numbers in front of her a background to the thoughts traipsing through her head like disorganized ushers. None of them knew where they were going, and they weren't even sure where they were coming from. Earth to Avery. Claire waved her hand in front of Avery's face. She blinked several times and took a breath, not even realizing that she hadn't breathed deeply in a while. Man, I zoned out there. Claire's mouth bowed in sympathy. I know you've got your reasons for doing what you did, but girl, you have got to pull yourself together. I know. Avery scrubbed her face. They worked for a few minutes, each typing away at their respective tasks. There was more going on inside Claire's head than the lunch count, though. She continually glanced at Avery out of the corner of her eye. It wasn't long before she worked up the courage to broach the subject that was eating away at her. Do you want to know what I think? Avery grinned, trying to change the subject. That Chris Hemsworth should be our commencement speaker? That. And that you're in love with the guy. With Chris? Who isn't? Avery fanned her face. No. Claire laughed. With Ben. She shook her head. It's not love. I've had true love, and this was different. Different how? Claire demanded. Um, it was like. She grasped for words. Why did they all leave her when it came to Ben? Going off the drop on a roller coaster. My stomach would lift up and my heart would beat so fast. Uh-huh. And I wouldn't be able to think clearly sometimes. Like he scrambled my brains with a touch. With Luke, it was comforting, warm, and there was trust for Ian's. You don't trust Ben? I do, just not as much as I did Luke. But that's not fair. Claire turned away from her screen, dropping all pretenses of actually working. You knew Luke before you could walk. Of course you trusted him more. You cut off Ben before he had a chance to prove himself. She rubbed her arms, trying to ward off the chill that had leapt out and grabbed onto her. I'm done talking. She had to stop now. Her resolve wasn't that strong. She wanted Ben more than she'd wanted anything. The last time she remembered wanting something this much, it was the desire to become a mother. Savannah, Margot, and Sophie marched into the office. Avery smiled at the sight of the three of them in their school uniforms with matching ponytails and wide grins. Best of all was Savannah's straight back and level gaze. She wasn't staring at the carpet anymore. What a difference a friend, or in this case, two friends, had made. Avery barely managed to hold back her desire to hug Savannah tight and tell her how proud she was of her. Hello there. What are you girls up to? Avery glanced first at Margot and then Sophie before stepping forward as their official spokeswoman. We made you a thank you card in art. She held out the piece of paper that had been folded in half to make the card. Avery accepted it with a wink. The front said, thank you for the fun. When she opened the card, Avery's eyes blurred. The girls had drawn the five of them with different colored face masks, Avery with a pink one and Ben with blue. 
She wrapped the girls in a group hug. Thank you so much. I love it. They exchanged grins before heading for the door. At the last second, Savannah ran back and threw her arms around Avery's neck, giving her the hug Avery had craved. Thank you for making me friends. Avery clung to her little frame, soaking her in. Your smile did all the work. Savannah hurried to catch up with Sophie and Margot. Avery leaned back and wiped the moisture from under her eyes. Oh, she gets to me. That girl needs a mama. Claire lowered her chin and pinned Avery to her chair with a look. A fresh wave of tears came. I could have been a great mama for her. Claire passed a tissue box over the filing cabinet. You should go for it. You don't understand. I had true love. You don't get two shots at it, that wouldn't be fair. Fair? Who said life is fair? Claire snatched the box away. You're not going to love Ben the same way you loved Luke, because Ben isn't Luke. But guess what? You're not the same Avery who married Luke. The first day you came into this office, you were a shell of a human, so lost in your grief that packing a lunch was difficult. Avery nodded. She remembered those days, the feeling of being half a person. But that's not you anymore. You're bolder. You've grown. You're stronger. That's the woman Ben fell in love with, and you're the one he wants. Give yourself permission to be happy. Avery balled the tissue in her palm. Give herself permission? Was that a thing? Did she really have to do that? She thought about Evelyn, about the time she could have let herself love again and chose not to. That was the key, she chose not to fall in love. People said you couldn't help who you fell in love with? Well, those people had never met Evelyn. But just because she and Evelyn had lost the same person didn't mean they had to be the same person. She'd looked to Evelyn for strength for so long, relied on her to understand, to coax her through, that Avery hadn't even considered that Evelyn would give her crappy advice. Shoot. That wasn't very nice. She loved Evelyn. Evelyn had been the best mother-in-law on the planet. And you couldn't find a more devoted grandmother. Ask yourself this, Claire continued. Would Ben make you happy? Avery didn't have to think twice. The sound of her own laughter echoed in her ears. Yes. Then why would it be bad even if it's different? It wasn't. But what if it doesn't last? She sniffed, eyeing the box of tissues Claire held out of her reach. What if I go for it and not only my heart is shattered, but Landon's? Landon is a great kid. He's strong. He smiles and laughs and gets good grades, and not once have I ever heard him pity himself for losing his dad. Give him some credit. Avery pressed her fist into her chest. Hit me where it hurts, why don't ya? Claire held out the tissue box as a peace offering. I'm just trying to get you to see the situation clearly. Avery jumped up. She reached across the filing cabinet and hugged Claire. I've got to go talk to Landon. Landon? Shouldn't you talk to Ben? Avery laughed. Yes. I'm going to do that too. She winked and hurried out the door and down the hall to the fifth grade classrooms. Poking her head in the door, she smiled at Mrs. Truman. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I borrow Landon for a moment? Of course. Landon stood up and wove through the desks. Sup? Avery held back her chuckle. He thought he sounded so mature. I have to ask you a question. Shoot. He was in full-on legit mode today. He waited, his blue eyes interested even if the rest of him slouched with indifference. How would you feel about Ben and me dating? He lifted a shoulder. That's cool. Really? She wanted to give him as many opportunities to share his feelings as possible. Boys didn't blurt things out, she was learning. Sometimes you had to pry emotions out of them with a crowbar. 
Yeah, he's lit. Okay, just so we're clear. Dating, for old people like me, can lead to marriage. He lifted a hand. Here's the deal. You don't want to see me kissing girls, and I don't want to see old people kissing and stuff like that. So as long as we're good on that, then I'm fine. Avery almost fell over. Are you kissing girls? E.W. Mom, no. Darn right, ew, Avery muttered. Deal. She held out her hand, and they shook on it. Landon went back to class, and Avery headed back to the front office. Everything okay? Claire asked. Avery sat in her chair and slid under the desk. It's lit. Now I just have to figure out how to tell Ben that I take everything I said before back. Just tell him. Men are straightforward. Avery nodded. You're right. Any big gesture she could come up with would be tiny compared to what he could do with all his money. But he wasn't the type to care that much about putting on a show. She ran her fingers over her phone, composing a text in her mind. No, a text wasn't right. Something this important had to be said in person. After work, Avery dropped Landon off at a friend's house to study. She had the feeling they'd be studying the Xbox more than their math books, but that was fine. Landon was a star student in math and he always had his homework done. That was one thing she felt truly blessed with, a child who cared about his grades. Not all kids did. She chalked it up to God's grace in her life. The route to Ben's house was not easy to remember. The cove was off the beaten path until you were right on top of the iron gates. Then you couldn't miss it. She pulled up to the security station and fumbled for her wallet. Why did she have such a big purse anyway? Hi, she croaked to the guard, a different man than was there last time. This guy had tribal tattoos all up his forearms that disappeared under short sleeves. Tattoos didn't intimidate her, it was the corded arms underneath and the perpetual scowl that got her hands a-shaking. I was, uh, here the other day with Ben. Ben Wileby and his daughter. I'm the secretary at her school. Heaven help her, she was rambling on like a crazy person. Anyway, I need to have a word with Mr. Wileby. There. That sounded much more official. ID? She handed over her driver's license. The guard shut the small window and turned to his computer. One Walker Hayes song later, the window opened again. You're not on the list. Please take an immediate right and vacate the premises. Wait, what? You have to leave. His coal black eyes made her want to turn on the heater. No. No, I can't leave until I talk to Ben. She had to tell him how she felt, or she'd explode. Wait, she shouldn't think words like explode while talking to a security guard. That was bad. Her declaration was met with a stony glare. Two could play at that game. She narrowed her eyes. I promise I'm legit. Look at the list. I've been in here before. We rode in his airplane to the magic lamp park. Take a flying carpet and head back, lady. I don't have time for this. Avery's mouth fell open. Hey! She threw off her seatbelt, opened the door, and jumped out to pound on the window. You can't talk to me like that. The guard pressed a button on the wall. Avery's desperation hiked. Listen. I did a really bad thing to a really nice man, and I need to get in there and tell him I was an idiot and that I love him. The guard put his hand on the taser at his belt as he reached for the knob. Suddenly, three other guards appeared, weapons drawn. Avery flattened herself against the door before remembering there was one inside there too. Hands up, barked one of them. She wasn't sure which, because her head was spinning. This was not good. Chapter 23 Ben was in his recliner, reading Forbes Forbes. Savannah was lounging on the couch. 
In an attempt to keep her mind off Avery, he'd bought her a new series of books, and she was plowing through them at record speeds. The sound of a bubbling stream came through the speakers in the ceiling and hidden in the walls. A sense of calm permeated the house. Which was fantastic, except that it was exactly distracting enough to keep his thoughts off of Avery. He'd come up with a dozen different arguments as to why they should be together in the last half hour alone. Excuse me, Mr. Wileby? Herb appeared in the doorway, his hands clasped behind his back. May I have a word? Of course. Ben followed Herb into the hall, where Savannah couldn't hear their conversation. What is it? Herb gulped, the extra skin on his neck wrinkling. There's been a disturbance at the front gate, and your assistance is requested at the security checkpoint. Curious. There hadn't been an issue since they'd moved in. However, if there was a new threat against his daughter, Ben wanted to know about it. He pointed to the library, where Savannah was lost in the diary of a wizard. If she surfaces, will you let her know I'll be back soon? Of course. I'll stay close. Thanks. Ben took the golf cart down to security checkpoint one. There were two buildings set aside for security. The guards lived and trained on site. But part of each building was set aside for the business of keeping the cove and its residents safe. Ben was met at the door by Jean Claude, the head of Bravo Security. What's the problem? She refuses to leave. Jean Claude pushed open the door and made his way down a hallway. His heavily laden belt creaked. Who? Ben asked. Her. Jean Claude pointed to a window with his thick, square finger. Ben peered in to see Avery slumped in a chair against the wall. She chewed her lip and tapped her foot. His heart lurched as if it had been sitting quietly, waiting to see her again before it could beat. Should I have her arrested? asked Jean Claude. Ben reached for the handle. Let's see what she has to say first, shall we? Would you like me to come in? Jean Claude offered. I think I can handle this one. Ben swung the door open and swaggered in. She'd come to him. It could be that she'd forgotten something on the plane and come to reclaim it. He shouldn't let his heart beat so fast. Avery's head came up and she scrambled to her feet. Ben. Her eyes went wide and her face lit up, making Ben's heart hammer all the more. She threw herself at him, and he caught her, partly out of reflex and mostly out of a desire to hold her. What are you doing here? I had to talk to you. I made a mistake. He rubbed circles on her back with his palm. Which one are you talking about? She shoved at him but didn't shove him away. Her cheeks dusted pink. This is harder than I thought. She fiddled with the front of his shirt, her eyes lowered. Okay. So I thought that real love is all the same, but then I realized that it's not. It's not, he pressed. There was something happening here, something that made him hopeful. No. It's like, I love Landon, but I also love Savannah, but I love them differently because they're different. He smiled. And you drove all the way over here to tell me that? Yes. She smiled as if she'd just revealed the secrets to the universe. He dropped his arms. I'm glad you love Savannah. But don't you see? Avery bunched his shirt in her hands. That means that I don't have to love you the same way I loved Luke. I can love you different, and different is okay. Okay? He wasn't sure how he felt about being okay. He brought his hands together behind her back and linked his fingers. Her blush deepened. More like fantastic. He smiled, touching his forehead to hers. I like fantastic. She giggled. Do you want to try this again? She tugged him closer. Ben pressed his lips together. I'd love to. But you're going to jail for trespassing, and I don't date inmates. What? Her mouth fell open and her hands went slack. She glared toward the door. 
I told them you knew me. That big guy with the tattoos wouldn't even listen. And then these guys are all it's a private residence, miss, and did you try calling? She stomped her foot. There's not a romantic bone in any of them. I'm kidding. Ben couldn't stop the laughter that rushed through him. She was so cute when she was riled up. Yet another part of her that he found he enjoyed. Avery smacked his arm. You can't tease me about that. These guys almost shot me. There was a beep indicating an intercom was turning on. Tossed, said a deep voice. Avery shook her fists at the speaker, making Ben laugh harder. I would have paid your bail, he said. You. She slugged him in the arm and then leaned into him. You'd better kiss me until I forgive you. The air charged with awareness as Ben brushed his hands down her side before drawing her body flush with his. I hope you like to hold a grudge. You're about to find out how stubborn I can be. She lifted onto her toes and tipped her face, inviting him in closer. The lights clicked off, leaving them in darkness and telling him that security had left. I'm looking forward to it. Ben pressed his lips to hers and did his best to say he was sorry for teasing her. What he found was that she was apologizing to him for pushing him away. Once they were clear on both those counts, they began to explore opening their hearts once again. The kiss slowed and became tender, full of promises and dreams. What he found in that kiss was his partner and his best friend. Their roads may have been bumpy and difficult, but they were together now, and that was the best place in the world to be. Epilogue You know how to throw a party. Avery scanned the backyard full of the Coast residents and Savannah's and Landon's friends from Belfast Academy. The sound of happy children filtered through the trees and large fronds. Adults congregated in shady spots, discussing the changing world market, developments in tech, and the Mariners' last win. The sun was on the verge of setting. They'd had a perfect summer day without a cloud in sight. Ben's yard wasn't a backyard so much as it was a water park. There were three pools, five slides, two hot tubs, and several water features. They'd set up three tents, one for tables, one for food, and one for the old-fashioned soda counter, where servers in white shirts and red bow ties mixed Italian sodas and dished gelato. Well, it's all in the details. Ben wrapped his arms around her from behind. Evelyn came down the nearest waterslide, her hands over her head. She hooped as she splashed into the pool. She may never leave, Avery laughed. Once Evelyn had met Ben, and Avery had put her foot down that she wasn't giving him up, she'd melted considerably towards the idea of moving forward. Forward. Not on. They all knew Luke would always be a part of their lives and in their hearts. I'll give her a room in the small house. Avery laughed as she turned into Ben's embrace. He kissed her once, and then once again. Better not let Landon see us, Avery teased. They'd tried to keep from kissing in front of the kids, but as time went on and they became closer, the kissing just happened. Though not without Landon yelling, ew, every time. Ben. Dawson Fitzwilliam slapped a hand on Ben's shoulder. His diabetic alert dog sat next to him, her brown eyes taking them all in. A pretty woman held his hand, her eyes alight with laughter. You've been avoiding me, Dawson accused. His companion elbowed him lightly in the stomach. Don't give him a hard time. You'd avoid that comment card too. She smiled at Avery and introduced herself as Lizzie. You're the one who filled out the after survey, aren't you? Avery ducked her head. That was me. Dawson laughed heartily. Was it all true? Tell me it was all true. Avery lifted her chin and grinned. Every word. Ben groaned. I have an allergy, he offered as an explanation. They all laughed, and he joined in. Too bad we can't use you two as a poster couple for the blind date app. Lizzie leaned into Dawson. We're rolling it out across the nation. Congratulations, said Avery. 
They chatted for a few more minutes before Dawson saw someone he needed to talk to before the next Tech Tank filming. Don't forget my tickets for the show. Ben pointed at him. And make it four. You got it. Dawson and Lizzie left. Avery hugged herself. That'll be fun. I've never seen a television show filmed before. Ben nodded. He scanned the party and gave a slight nod that everything was in order before taking her hand. Come on. I want to show you something. He pulled her through the grand house and out the front door where the carousel was lit up, turning at a sedate pace. Music played softly and the lights reflected off the mirrors and gold paint. The sound seemed to be captured in the leaves overhead, making this a space separate from the rest of the world. It's stunning. Come on. They made their way across the brick driveway and then the tended grass. Ben grabbed a bar, and Avery jumped with him, laughing as she grabbed for a lavender horse. This is my kind of horse. She climbed up on the pink saddle with both legs hanging off one side and patted the horse's polished neck. I don't think you'll ever get me off this thing. Ben stayed leaning against the pole, his hand in his pocket. He watched her for a moment, his soulful eyes full of emotion. What if none of you left? She cocked her head to the side. What do you mean? I mean, I want us to be a family. Ben pulled a ring out of his pocket and held it up. The large diamond glittered against the wide gold band. Avery gasped. It's beautiful. What if you and Landon stayed, forever? Avery pressed her fingers over her lips. Ben, she managed. I love you more than I have ever loved another person. And I love Landon. I don't want to replace his father, but I'd like to be the best dad I can be for him. Avery reached for him. Her heart was in her throat and her head was in the trees. She'd seen Landon look to Ben much like Savannah looked to her, as a guide to get him through the transition from boy to teenager. To have this man, this caring, loving man, guide Landon into adulthood would be a gift. But her soul cried out that there was more to her love for Ben than what kind of father he'd be to her son. There was the love a woman had for a man, the kind of love that was exciting and set butterflies aflutter, but there was also the quiet love, the deep kind that flowed through her soul like a river that never ran dry. I'd like that. Yeah. I love you, Ben. She pulled him close, and their lips came together in an explosion that had been building up inside of Avery since the moment they met. It was like when two smaller stars fuse together and become one bright, shining, powerful light in the darkness. Their family would be amazing. She wasn't naive enough to believe there wouldn't be struggles along the way, that was life but they were stronger together than they were apart. Not because either of them was weak, but because they brought out the best in one another. That was something Avery could hold on to forever. You've been listening to her awkward blind date with a billionaire. A billionaire bachelor, cove romance novel. Written by Lucy McConnell. Narrated by Christina Dimmick. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your trip and had fun in Seattle on her awkward blind date with a billionaire. For more billionaire books, stay tuned, subscribe, all those wonderful things because I will be posting more. And there are some already on the channel. So I'll put a link up and you can click on that to get to my billionaire playlist. If you have any comments, want to leave me a note below and let me know how you liked it. I would surely appreciate it. I'll talk to you later.